Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our 2021 planning commission retreat. Um, generally in the olden days of yore, we would be meeting in person and doing fun things like having coffee and snacks. And if you needed to excuse yourself momentarily, you would just get up and leave. Um, so please just do that. If you need to here, go make yourself a coffee, go get a snack. Turn your camera off for a second. That's totally okay. This is very casual. It's just a conversation this morning. So we have about um, seven items, and that's distilled down from the information that everybody sent um, in what they'd like to discuss this morning. Try to find some common themes as we go through it. And then um, at the end, we have kind of a lightning round, throw anything out, but Feel free to bring anything up at any moment because again, um, it's not really about timekeeping this morning. It's it's really just about having conversation. So I've asked um, mm -hmm. Pat Young to kick us off this morning, and um, Pat, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Chair Fox. Good morning, everybody. As the chair said, I'm Pat Young, the director of the planning and development department. I've met. Most of you and worked with most of you, those, those of you have, and I very much look forward to doing so in the future. Um, I first want to take a moment to thank uh, you for the outstanding work uh, that you do and are doing. You are confronting historically high uh, volumes of cases. You're uh, confronting historically high complexity of cases, and you're um, confronting um, a large number of uh, proposed policy changes. So it's really almost a perfect storm of work and, and you all are handling it with, um, with, with great uh, uh, class and skill. And I really appreciate it. Um, I know you don't hear a lot from me and that's leads to my next point of thanking our planning and development staff who I think do such a capable job of supporting you all. Um, as I've said to you before, my door is always open to you. Uh, metaphorically now, literally soon as we return to the workplace. Um, but uh, there's really, I don't find off very much need because you have Ken Bowers, Travis Crane, uh, Janitha Eason, and, and David York, who are the, the finest in my 25 years, the finest team of folks supporting the planning commission uh, I've ever seen. I think they represent dozens of years of experience and tremendous insights uh, and, and uh, I think bring those to, uh, to support you all and to amplify your voices, which is what we wanna see. Um, <clears throat> I, I alluded to the challenges you all are confronting. Um, I, again, I've been doing this work for about 25 years now, and I, I, I've found that it's universally true that when there's an increasing share of your um, cases uh, that are um, infill or redevelopment. So infill meaning um, that there's it's uh, undeveloped piece of property surrounded by existing neighbors or, or nearby existing developments. When an increasing share of your cases are infill or redevelopment, so when you're tearing something down and redeveloping it, um, versus what I'll call greenfield, so the more traditional model we saw 20, 30 years ago, where it was a you know, new subdivision out on the edge of town and, and not near any existing neighbors, I think that that often leads to um, two things. One, um, a lot of scrambling to try to adapt policy to those new demands. And then the second thing is kind of it, it exposes a tension between the two roles I've, I've seen you all trying to play, and I think very successfully. Um, one role is kind of helping facilitate the resolution of, of concerns of folks that appear before you. So often neighbors um, and, and essentially work with uh, applicants to try to have those concerns addressed. Then the second role is, is fairly and consistently apply adopted policy. And, and I, I don't think those things are a conflict, but they are attention. And they're especially attention when there's um, in, in a large share of infill and redevelopment. But I, I would contend, uh, well, and so when, this, when that tension exists, it, it can often lead, as you all um, see and experience, to, to lengthy and conflict-ridden uh, proceedings. And, and I would submit that this is you know, gonna be a permanent, uh, sadly, <laughs> a permanent condition of our growth going forward as we uh, approach uh, half a million population, um, and we'll exceed that quite soon, um, like very likely, uh, as we continue to grow. And, and, and so I think we have to adapt and recognize and, re and reflect that. I think staff has identified kind of four ways. Uh, I'm going to call them the four Ps. I wasn't trying to be cute. It just kind of worked out that way. 
um, four, four ways that we want to support you um, in helping manage that tension and continuing to be successful. The, the first is what I call process. So the, the way that we deliver cases to you, the way we communicate um, what we're doing kind of behind the scenes before cases get to you, and then you all continuing to work on your bylaws and your use of Robert tools and other procedural changes. And I want to recognize Chair Fox for, I think, making tremendous improvements in that space. And I've, I've seen that. I do watch all of your meetings, uh, usually not in real time, unfortunately, but um, and I've, I've seen, um, I think, improvement in progress there so that there is a, a smoother, there's more clarity about, um, um, you know, mo motion making and uh, the flow of, of deliberation so that it's a smooth process, transparent and, and accessible to everybody. And I know there are several items in your agenda today that look at that process piece. So we want to be partners there and support you any way we can. Um, I, I just talked about you all's work through the bylaws and Robert's rules. We certainly have things that we can continue to do um, to make sure that you're set up to be successful and, and to have efficient and effective outcomes. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later in one of the other areas. So the first is process. The second is policy. I think, um, you know, you all see difficult cases that often have re recurring areas of concern, right? Certainly affordable housing is a great example. So we really want to be better partners to you. I think we're, we're good partners, but we need to continue to improve to uh, make sure that we are engaging you early and often on policy issues so that we can try to resolve some of these longstanding conflicts to the extent we can through policies in the comprehensive plan in the UDO, rather than having to essentially have ad, ad hoc deliberations and, and kind of agonizing conversations with neighbors and developers over and over again, right? It's, um, everyone knows Einstein's definition of insanity is, you know, trying the, uh, the same thing and expecting different results. So we, we want to work with you on those areas of policy conflict and tension that you're continuing to identify. I know our staff does that very much now, but we want to be even more proactive. And so I think we're, you're going to see more requests to have um, early engagement as we're exploring policy options and or if council sends us a policy issue that we engage you early. Um, the third area is public engagement, um, huge priority for our department. Of course, we're all very sensitive and to the, um, the, the um, fact that the CACs are no longer city um, supported and uh, supported. We still will absolutely attend um, and use the CACs as a tremendous resource, but we certainly want to focus on expanding uh, the base of participation. Um, I think that that's in, in two areas, right? So on, on, on individual cases is very important. I think you've heard about, and if you haven't, you will today, our efforts to expand what we call uh, the zoning portal, which is similar to the text amount portal. We really think that that will get a lot of really good comments before you hear the case so that when, as soon as you get the case, you will have a very nice and I think broad and deep framing of key neighbor concerns that are in writing with staff responses. So that's again, that's really, um, it's been very valuable for text amendments. And I think it's gonna have that same value in, in zoning. Another thing we wanna do is stand up a planning academy program. Um, that's something that um, I helped lead when I was over in Durham uh, for, and it was very, very successful of really trying to meet people um, kind of where they are um, in terms of understanding the, z the zoning and development process before something controversial is happening in their neighborhood. Let's just be direct about it. And building those relationships and and um, really making sure that they understand uh, fully and deeply the, the planning rules, policies, procedures, and requirements um, so that they can be kind of ombuds people um, with their neighbors and say, hey, you know, the planning, I learned at Planning Academy that um, they have to get a rezoning. And here's what a rezoning means so that um, you all and we and these public uh, hearings that you all hold are not the, the first time <laughs> they're hearing that. Now, that is a high aspiration, but by the time I left Durham, we had we had, had um, about 400 citizens come through that. And it was almost in every neighborhood of the community. We, we made very sure that we had a uh, racially, racially, geographically, demographically balanced group. And um, we had somebody we could call in every neighborhood and say, hey, um, we're not going to go ask you to, you know, represent the department, but you can go communicate to your neighbors what you learned at the planning academy. And it's really, I think, useful. So we're, we're going to 
we'll only push that. And then there's probably a lot of other things that are going to be coming down the road. We're still working with our partners and housing and neighborhoods that are leading our citywide engagement efforts. And we'll continue to share those with you. And then finally, and again, I'm sorry, I've gone a few minutes over time. I apologize. Um, finally, um, partnerships and incentives. So as, as I think you've heard from our attorney, uh, for sure, and you've heard from staff, um, North Carolina, maybe they haven't put it this way, I, I will. North Carolina is almost uniquely adverse in terms of a legal context to uh, compel or exact um, community benefits out of um, zoning applicants. I would put us 48th, 49th out of the 50 states in DC. Um, we have really, we have no local authority. We only have delegated authority or uh, authority that the state identifies for us. I'm not an attorney, but I think I'm framing this right. David can speak up. We have only the authority that the state provides us directly. Um, I think what that requires then when we want to really pursue things that are at the edge of or outside of our legal ability to compel like affordable housing is to really double down on our efforts to have partnerships and incentives with with private developers. So I know there's a lot of political conversation about the perception of that being giveaways to developers. We want to make sure we work with you all to understand these tools, to develop these tools, engage you early, make sure that you're heavily involved in this process so that you all can be um, hopefully you know, advocates and supporters of, of as we develop these tools to improve partnerships and incentives. The TIG program has been in the news the most. There's a, a number of other tools that are similar, including development agreements. Um, again, I think the, the legal context in North Carolina has really left us no choice, <laughs> but, to, but to take a partnership model, which is, going to be, which is going to mean getting engaged with a lot of these applicants to see if we can find ways that, not that we give them t uh, tax dollars, but that we um, maybe use their tax dollars to accelerate improvements that benefit um, very likely their development to some extent, but substantially the public benefit through things like affordable housing, through things like Greenway Connections, infrastructure improvements. Um, and all, almost always in these cases, the, the uh, and, and I would hope council would hold this, and I think they will, there's not just um, public money, but there's substantial private uh, money where they're they're putting in a number of improvements that are not we're not able to require or compel them to put in. And I say improvements or public benefits, workforce participation, affordable housing, things of that nature. So you're going to hear a lot more from us about that over the coming year as, as it becomes a bigger focus. So thank you all again. I'm sorry. I know I went a couple of minutes over my time, um, but thank you for your time. And um, I can stay for just a few minutes. I do have a 930. Um, if you have any questions, I know you have a very full agenda and uh, I wish you the best and thank you again for your work. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions or if we're allowed to use the chat, that might be easier. I don't know. Um, Commissioner Lampman. Um, I know that typically for bigger projects, um, there was the concept of using the P PUD process to complete some of these larger projects. Is there a way um, when a way to define substantially larger projects and then how they get handled on the front end with the community? Um, maybe earmark something that's going to be over some square foot or so many acres or some sort of substantial investment in that community and then have the planning department or whomever go out to the community and really educate early. Yeah, that's a great idea, Commissioner Lampman, and we we tried to reflect that um, modestly in having, as you all are well, well aware, a second community meeting being required for larger projects. So that was kind of a early down payment on that. We have more work to do. To your point, I think um, as we develop this toolkit of engagement, um, of partnership and incentive tools, those are going to involve very heavy, early and substantial engagement, kind of outside of the strictly zoning context, although that will often be involved, but talking about, you know, how we can try to get community benefits here and make sure that development um, uh, uh, benefits both the community and the new, the new residents and existing residents. Um, uh, and so we will continue to look at, at exactly what you're proposing there. Yeah. Because I'm having to figure out- Did I see Commissioner Miller? Did you have your hand up or Commissioner Lampman follow up? Sorry, I have a couple of questions. Um, 
so one of the other things that um, I've thought about with the text change to reduce our uh, time allotment for reviewing cases from 90 to 60 days. One of my thoughts in that was the community engagement component. So if you guys are early, that helps solve some of it. But, um, you know, the, the mindset of a developer going through the 90 day process. By the end of it, when we give it to council, even if we vote no on it, it's usually a better designed package that ends up going to council. Reducing it to the 60 days, I think, um, gives an opportunity where you can think, oh, okay, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. And, you know, you don't have to give so much on certain, you know, um, adjustments to the con or the conditions. So, you know, I just kind of that process there. Is there a way where. I'm hoping that early side discussion can lead to appropriate conditions that the developer, you know, can adhere to. Because again, the 60 days, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to try as hard. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Commissioner, again, as you're, I think, well, we're staff didn't propose that change, but we understand the intent to be to um, make um, the process more efficient and kind of focus people's minds. I think with 90 days, they feel like, oh, well, you know, we're going to have multiple meetings and then before there's a real decision to be made with less time, I think there hopefully there's more focus by all parties. I think what that does require is um, um, more eff uh, effective engagement by staff and, and by you all at, earlier in the process. And so our, our commitment is to work with you on figuring out how to best do that. Um, I've tried to flag a couple of ideas. I think Ken has a comment on that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think. Um, Part, part of the solution is that applicants need to show up for the first meeting with a more substantive set of conditions that address what they heard at the first neighborhood meeting, as well as now that we're using the online portal, the comments that they're getting there as well. I mean, as you're probably well aware, a lot of when the cases first appear to you appear in front of you, they're often conditional cases and they have a placeholder condition. My, my favorite one from recent memory was a, was a 5,000 square foot lot that had one condition prohibiting a stadium, you know, <laughs> that's not really a useful condition. It, it was obviously just there so they could file a conditional use um, uh, uh, case. And I think that we really want to start, um, and I think it's up to the to the commission to make this clear to applicants that you, you want to see a serious opening offer on the conditions that addresses the issues that were raised at those initial meetings, because that really is what the purpose of the neighborhood meeting is is to get those issues out on the table so that they could be in the application. That's why it's a pre-application requirement. I think that's exactly right, Ken. And I, I, I think, as I said earlier, the, the portal really will help facilitate that where you, you can come into the first meeting saying, here's the list of issues that the community has. And we, we, you all's expectation needs to be to see conditions that address or manage those in some way or be prepared to both deny it, but denial if they don't, handily. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett, did you have a question? Thank you, I had a comment, Chair Box. So, um, good morning, everybody. Since we're talking about this, um, something that has concerned me recently, because it seems to be happening more, happening more frequently, is with some of the more controversial cases, especially if we have voted to recommend denial or if there's been a split vote, we're seeing the applicants change conditions or add conditions once it goes to council and after they've been meeting with neighbors and then it gets to the public hearing and it's like, oh, can we get a two week delay? We wanna add these conditions. And it feels like it's making the planning commission less relevant because we're working with them, we're going through this process, we're getting these conditions, the neighbors are coming, and then they get blindsided at the council meeting. Some of the council people even say, oh, I didn't even realize that they had changed the conditions and it's in my district. Um, it just feels like an abuse almost of the process. And I'm hoping we'll see some changes to that where we actually are kind of working out the package in the rezoning process with the planning commission and not once it gets to council. If, if I could add something, this is David, um, Commissioner Bennett. I would say just the opposite. I think 
them wanting to change their zoning conditions after you've recommended denial is a direct response to what planning commission did. So I, although the change didn't happen while it was at your table, I do think applicants are reacting to what the planning commission is saying. Not necessarily on a time frame you'd like to see, and I appreciate that frustration, but I do see that those changes to conditions are a direct result of the planning commission's vote. So I don't think if they took you for granted, they wouldn't try to improve their case after you acted. So I just throw that out as another perspective of the same circumstance, but I appreciate the frustration. Vice Chair Winners. I was trying to get to my mute button, dancing around it. Um, so I'm glad we're having this conversation and it's something that I articulated uh, just yesterday. Um, and I just wanna give again voice to my concern is that when we're talking about communities that come, um, there, is, there is a disadvantage to communities that are more affluent that can hire third party um, um, attorneys and, and, and everything else to help advocate for them versus those who, may, who are not as affluent that may not have the resources to do so or understanding who to call and, and what questions to ask to have them show up and advocate. So that is the, the one reason why, the main reason why I voted against it uh, and also how we can ensure uh, a sense of equity across the board that irrespective of who shows up at, in terms of a third party or the or the talent of information that we're offering the same we're offering the we're being consistent um, that we're being just 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 as diligent if not more for those who do not have um, the 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 another advocate for them that we can then fill in that gap also that planning department will help fill in that gap to try to ensure that everyone receives the same um, understanding the same condition, the, just the same of everything, because that is a disparity that is uh, blatant as it comes to the table. So I just like to react. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, a, a, a wealthy community can do all sorts of things that a low wealth community cannot. They can hire their as an objector or they can, they can hire their own traffic here to like do the, the traffic impacts. Um, and the way up, but what I think we can offer up is that for any community, staff is a resource to provide you with to arm you with the facts, knowledge, and um, insights into the process to, to participate meaningfully. And any neighborhood group that calls us up and wants to meet on a case gets a meeting, and we're we're we are happy to play that role. Um, we feel you know we like it to make sure that all participants in the process can participate can participate meaningfully and from a, a place of knowledge. And um, I think that maybe there could be more done to let all communities know that staff is a resource for them, but we are here for all the citizens in the city um, to help them participate meaningfully in the process. Thank you for that, Mr. Bowers. Um, one other thing, just to tag on to um, what Vice Chair Winter said, I think one of the ways um, one of the ways we can do that is not give a disproportionate voice to those who come with their own hired uh, third parties. So when we hear a case um, and uh, delay a case to to allow their third party additional time to review, um, we are giving disproportionate voice, in my opinion to allow them their extra time. Whereas if we don't provide that, we're not doing that for communities of lower wealth who may not come with a third party. Um, I did see some hands. I'm sorry if I cut somebody off. Was it Commissioner Miller? It's in that same vein, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little under the weather, with the, um, with the shortened period for planning commission to review, I imagine that's going to take some meaningful education effort on, on behalf of staff to educate folks um, 
that this is going to be the new policy and practice of the planning commission. And then also moving forward for every case, some additional staff resources and engagement with each case before it gets to the planning commission so that it is more, um, it, it's more developed before it, we receive it. Um, and in particular folks with fewer resources that don't have the attorneys that are always on board. So I, I imagine that that's something that staff has already thought through to, in terms of their own resources and how to manage this, but wondering if you could share some of that with us. I think that um, the three things that we feel like are, are most closest to hand are deployment of the um, zoning case portal and, and strong promotion of that. And the second is standing up the planning academy program where we really get information out across the community about the process and, and essentially having, getting people prepared to participate in this process before they are confronted with a case, even if they're um, from a low wealth community, especially if they're from a low wealth community. And then I think we are looking at, and, and this is a, a third piece, um, hesitate to share it, but I'm going to anyway, <laughs> um, because it's a huge resource issue, but is, is having a higher level of support at the developers neighborhood meetings, right? So we already have staff that attends, but we could take a more proactive role. I've seen that in other communities I've been in where there, there's more of a active facilitation role rather than a, um, I'm just here as a resource for questions, but where the, the staff intervenes and facilitates more significantly. That's not something that we can deliver immediately because of the resource impact. There's, there's um, just pure uh, person power, there's training, um, there's engagement of the development community to make sure, hey, they understand that this will be changed. But I do think that may be the next frontier is, is where, you know, it to, I think to Commissioner Winter's point, um, it's a way of leveling the, the, the uh, imbalance and, and to Chair Fox's, the imbalance power dynamic that exists between uh, wealthy developers or with lo lots of um, professional assistance and and neighborhoods, especially low wealth neighborhoods. So I hope I hope that answers. Ken or Travis, you want to add to that? I I think that covers it. Vice Chair Winters. Thank you. I want to respond to um, Patrick. I thought with the last text change or or with the dismissal of the CACs um, and planning staff that they weren't allowed to be to facilitate the meeting or to intercede I, because that's what I was my understanding. So I please, so that is not correct. They can facilitate and they can make some corrections if something is stated in error. Sure, sure. Let, let, let me be real clear. I'm sorry if I wasn't. Um, I think there's two separate things, right? Um, as Ken alluded to, we absolutely still, we've been to many CAC meetings in the last year since they were, um, the recognition by the city and support by the city um, was taken away. We will come to any group that wants to invite us and talk about any topic of, that's in, in our um, purview. And we have done that and we will continue to do that. Th that's, but that's uh, kind of areas of general interest at the CAC. For specific cases, what I was referring to were the neighborhood meetings that we require the developer to hold. Um, the historical approach in that has been, this is the developer's meeting. They can basically say whatever they want. Um, and, and what I think what I'm suggesting is that we may need to adjust that dynamic to have it be um, the community's meeting where the developer presents information, but where staff kind of facilitates and manages it. As I tried to emphasize, we, we can't deliver that today. And that's not because of council's decision about the CACs, that's because of just re resource impact. That, that's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of preparation, it's a lot of follow up, it's training for staff. It's all possible, I think, but it's going to take um, development and refocusing and, and possibly new resources. So I, I hope I answered your question. Just to follow up, and if you're saying that it, it is this, the developer's meeting, then the developer would have to invite you to that meeting since it's their meeting. Or no, no, we're, we're, we're no. I'm, I'm sorry. I say it's the developer's meeting. That they are. What I mean by that is they're responsible for convening it, and they're mm -hmm. responsible for the agenda. So what's basically what's presented. Um, we are uh, invited and we almost always attend. Um, so I, I, I want to be clear that we're there, but, but the expectation has been that we are just a resource to answer factual questions. And, and what I'm Not suggesting so is, okay. Sorry, right, right, right. Right. Well, I think, right. So, for example, if a developer were to say something that was clearly inaccurate, 
you know, staff may stand up and say, that's not correct, but there, that hasn't been the expectation put on staff previously. What I'm suggesting is I think we might need to be a little more. I think you and I are really agreeing here. <laughs> we might, we mm -hmm. might need to be a little more proactive in that okay. space to say, well, the developer said X, Y, Z and Q, but please be aware of. A, B, C, D, E, and E. <laughs> and we, we haven't quite gone to that point yet. And again, like I said several times, I'm sorry to repeat myself. It's a resource issue, it's a training issue, it's an expectations mm -hmm. issue, but I think that's where we're headed. Okay, and I just want to finish out with this, if I may. I thank you for that. I think that is the part that has been that is missing, and I'm glad that, that you're mm -hmm. seeing that gap and trying to fill it. I know it's a lot, uh, but I do appreciate that effort. Um, since the former um, format was dismantled, um, I think that this 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 is better so thank um thank you thanks staff again i know it's a lot but for standing in the gap for all citizens uh between development and citizens so we can have a more a better win-win situation which should be the um goal for everyone so thank you thank, thank you, you vice chair really appreciate those comments absolutely i do have to leave thank you all so much for inviting me and you have a very full agenda very great stuff on it best of uh, luck and look forward to seeing you again in the near future Thank you very much. Um, if you guys are okay, I think it's probably a good point to transition um, into um, the second item on our agenda. Um, I asked Travis to put together a book report um, and we'll see the results of which at this point. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Bennett. Sorry, my mouse had disappeared. I couldn't. Um, I, I just before we move, I just wanted to say this one thing just before I forgot, because I think one thing that we can do is to request that the applicants do a, um, I'm trying to think of the word, a better job, for lack of a better term, of summarizing the neighborhood meetings in their application. I think what we I try to always make sure I read that so I have an idea of the types of comments they perceived from the neighbors. And I think some do a better job than others. Um, some just it's like traffic or mm -hmm. water and some actually will write like a sentence and tell, what did they say about traffic? What was the concern? And I think that would help us too, um, especially sometimes when there might be comments but there may not be people signed up to speak, or we may not have gotten email communication. If we have that, then we know going into our meeting, okay, this is, you know, this, this, these are the types of comments that were given and we can sort of frame our thinking and our questions around that. So I just, maybe that's something that, I mean, I don't know how we would, maybe in the training that Patrick was talking about, just getting them to do a fuller response. I think to some extent, you know, piggybacking on Patrick's remarks of a larger role for staff, one of those roles could be um, to supplement that. I mean, to be cynical about it, you got to look at the incentive structure and what is the incentive structure for the for the applicant to create a complete record of every negative thing that was said at the meeting. I mean, it, well, it might you know, be positive too. I mean, I just, right. you know. <laughs> Exactly, but I think you know a third party could maybe be a little bit more dispassionate in terms of capturing the full gist of what was said. And you know, at this point, it's a it's a it's a procedural requirement. Um, in order, we either have to be very specific about how much detail goes in those minutes, which would be very hard to put in the code, or we kind of have to accept what they produced and move into the process. And you, and you know, since you did not attend the meeting, you don't have a really good way of judging how good the record was. Um, only someone who was there at the record at the meeting can make that judgment and staff are obviously there at the meeting. So, um, I think that's something that we at the staff level should look into a little bit more in terms of how to make sure that we're getting a high quality record out of these neighborhood meetings and is really uh, surfacing all, all the issues that were raised. Well, thanks. I wasn't trying to give you more work, but thank you. I actually, I, I'm. If I'm remembering correctly, I want to say it was the Pleasant Grove Church Road case where the applicant actually provided the recording of the meeting and we were able to watch it. I found that really useful. So we were able to see all the comments in the chat box and watch the video. Um, I thought that was good. That was one, I think that's one benefit 
along with all of the negatives I might comment on later, of um, of the digital engagement format was that we we got to be there just at a different time. Um, and that, of course, raises a whole other issue, which is once we feel like the danger of in-person meetings mm -hmm. is well and truly over, what is our attitude towards um, these online neighborhood meetings? So I won't bother to try to answer that right now. Okay. <laughs> it's coming. Um, one, I think one more thing, and then um, I'm really excited for Travis's book report. Um, uh, Commissioner Lamman. Yeah, uh, two real quick things. One is I love the online portal because not just, you know, getting that feedback in a consolidated format online, which is really helpful, but um, also a lot of people who are in support of projects now feel it's okay to post their support. So I think that's really good. One of the things we don't see on the commission is people who are in favor. It's usually people who are in opposition that show up. So I think that that's a real positive thing. The other thing is along the lines of the, um, the developers meetings is I might not be looking in the right place. Is there a way that we have an opportunity to like to at least tend or, or watch those meetings at all? So, um, at the present moment, I don't think there is. Um, as, as Patrick mentioned, and we've alluded to the, the meetings now are scheduled and hosted by the applicant. So we, I think as a staff receive a link, but it's not made public. So I think the next step here, if we were to address that comment would be to make the link publicly available essentially to the world, right? Which is something we could explore and, and it's part of the, I think, package of enhancements we could look at. Uh, with our, um, the way that we're, we're going to help staff up those neighborhood meetings. That might be helpful on that front end too. Um, if, if, you know, we're able to at least sit in on some of the more controversial ones, let's say, I think the developer is going to be more thoughtful about our presence there. And it's almost kind of like a prelude to, okay, here's what you're going to be expecting in terms of conversation at the commission. Mm -hmm. When 1 thing I'd like to caution us on though is, um. If, if members of the commission attended in person a developers meeting, you 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 may be requested to speak on behalf of the commission, and I and I would not recommend doing that. So I wouldn't recommend putting yourself in a position where that could occur. Um, okay, so um, on to um, kind of a summary of all of our meetings during the pandemic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um... And I want to just take a step back and appreciate the conversation we've just had. I know our agenda had the introduction slated for like five or 10 minutes. Um, okay. Reminder that one, I'm not good at um, judging how long things will take. And two, uh, that those time frames are just guidelines. I mean, this again, this is your your retreat. So the, the conversation here um, should be useful and helpful to y'all. So just want to acknowledge that. Um, so I've got a, a couple of slides uh, in a slide deck to walk through. Um, Chairperson Fox asked for some background data about um, just how we've been doing in digital meetings. And we've all had to adjust to you know, this type of, of platform. Um, as you know, the last meeting we had on April 27th marked the one year point of us conducting virtual meetings. So some people have only been uh, virtual. Um, you know, I know that most of us have been in person at, at one time or another, but for the planning commission. Uh, so hopefully we, we will return um, to a, a, ver a uh, in person platform in the near future. Um, hopefully taking some of what we've learned over the course of the past year and incorporating that into our process. So if you give me a second, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. And not mess it up. Um, someone give me a thumbs up. Can I see you on camera? You can see this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. So, um. Again, this is, um, just a recap of. How we've been doing meeting during the, the pandemic with all of our virtual meetings. Uh, I'm going to start out with just the process itself. So, um, as y'all know. Uh, reasoning process, and, and that's really what this is focused on, is very linear in nature. When uh, somebody has an idea to rezone property, they first come in and talk to staff, um, and then there's uh, a series of steps to walk through uh, to process the rezoning application. So these 
these green boxes and bars represent the different steps that people need to walk through, along with some uh, time frames associated with them. So, uh, as I mentioned, before an application is even submitted, there is a staff meeting where staff talks to the applicant about process and uh, policies and expectations uh, going through the process. Uh, there is the required neighborhood meeting that happens again before an application is submitted, um, which uh, we've we've talked about a little bit this morning. And then there's the staff review period, which is about 45 days in, in time. Uh, and that's when we start uh, our clock. So I know that, that y'all are um, also subject to a, a shot clock of sorts during your review. So is staff at this point. Um, we're required to, de to deliver a completed zoning application to you within 45 days. So then uh, once staff is winding up their review, uh, oftentimes there's a requirement for a second neighborhood meeting. And this is something that was added uh, last June. Uh, certain projects of a certain size or a certain request uh, require the second neighborhood meeting. What we found is that a majority of our zone cases fall into that bucket. So the second neighborhood meeting typically uh, will be required. And then there's the planning commission review um, that as we've talked about this morning has been reduced to 60 days, um, but you can request a time extension from city council. And then once city council receives your certified recommendation, um, I've got a 30 day limit there, but that's really a limit on changing conditions. So. Uh, any conditional use zoning case, uh, the conditions can change for uh, up to 30 days after the public hearing has been closed. So, you know, generally that's a two to four week uh, time frame once the, the public hearing has ended. And then finally, there's a decision that's rendered by uh, the city council. So let's see if I can make this thing advance. Before we leave yeah. that slide, can, yes. I, can I just ask in, in the previous slide, um, when we're talking about instituting a new academy and, and that kind of thing, where would that fit in this process timeline? That's a, that's a great question. So the planning academy would be a standalone um, effort that runs parallel to rezoning. So it's not necessarily a part of the rezoning process. It's more of an educational opportunity uh, for the citizenry. And um, you know, we've done something like this previously. Housing and Neighborhoods has um, a neighborhood college that we have participated in for years. Um, and it's a, a wide ranging program uh, that involves many other departments and divisions. Planning is one of those. So there's one night where planning staff will show up and give a presentation. Uh, what we envision now for the planning academy is it would be a much more robust program that, that is offered um, multiple times. Uh, with uh, many different people invited to come and listen to staff and ask questions. So it, it really is a parallel process, if that makes sense. And it'd be available on demand as well. If people wanted I'm to look sure at yet. it. I mean, that's, that, that's something we're, we're still trying to work out uh, at this point. So it's, it's still a pretty uh, new idea for us and we're, we're working through the details now. Thank you. But those are questions. So um, let's take a look at, at some of your metrics. We took a look back uh, beginning in January of this year um, at all of your meetings. So you see the chart at the bottom uh, that represents your planning commission meetings, not including committee meetings starting January 12th through our last meeting on April 27. So in that time frame, planning commission has reviewed 64 items uh, over the course of nine meetings, which again, is a very robust and heavy workload. I think you all have heard me say previously that last year we, we saw a high watermark of rezoning cases um, somewhere north of 65, 66 cases. Um, and that was the most, uh, the highest number of zoning cases that I personally have seen uh, with the city of Raleigh. And I, I started here in 2008. Uh, so you all saw um, a, a pretty high uh, volume of workload there. So over the course of nine meetings, you had 64 different discussion items. Uh, sometimes items were repeated on agendas, and that's one of the, the threads that we'll pull on here. You had an average of just over seven discussion items on each agenda, which is uh, fairly full. And then on average, uh, there would be a deferral of just over three items per meeting um, for, um, for each agenda. So, you know, if you look at each individual meeting, you can see the number of cases decided, number of deferrals, and then percentage of, of items deferred by meeting, and then an aggregate total. 
all the way on the right. So obviously, a uh, higher percentage of deferral, uh, not extremely optimal, uh, and we'd want to see the number uh, creep down a bit. Um, you know, the January 12 meeting, good example of um, high number of deferrals uh, with two thirds of your cases uh, being deferred. April 27, a great example of a very efficient meeting. So just looking at that in a little bit different perspective, a little bit different way. Um, the, the green bar here is the number of items decided. The red bar is number of deferrals per meeting, again, listed on the bottom of your screen. So uh, again, using January 12 as your example, uh, you see a very tall uh, red bar, which means you deferred uh, many more items. And then April 27 uh, had decisions on the vast majority, 90% of your items there. And then finally breaking it down just a little bit further, uh, what we're showing here uh, is by meeting the number of items on uh, each portion of your agenda. So the green here represents a committee report. Um, the red is old business. The yellow or orange is new business. And then the purple is total. So uh, you're typically going to have a committee report. Uh, you're typically going to have some old business and then some new business that all stack up into that purple bar uh, total item. So, um, you know, having uh, a high red bar here, the old business represents the items that continue to come back um, over and over again. So, um, again, the, the goal here should be to reduce the old business and keep our new business a little bit higher. So, looking at this data, I got curious. Um, and wanted to look back through a couple of different snapshots through time. So we've talked a bit about the January through April 2021 uh, data that we just looked at. Also look back at similar periods in time for 2019 and 2017. And for each one of these um, snapshots, we looked at consecutive meeting runs. Um, we looked at nine meetings that were consecutive. Uh, so for 2019, it was January through May. And for 2017, it was June through December because that's when we started using our board doc system. So we had the data pretty readily available. Um, you can see the first column there is your average number of items on an agenda for these respective stretches. And um, certainly, uh, if you look at that first column, you see in 2021, you saw an average of uh, two items more per agenda than we saw in 2017. So to reinforce that point that, that y'all are staying really busy. Um, items decided have gone up uh, on average per um, per meeting. So um, now we're we're seeing an average of uh, four cases decided or four items decided uh, per agenda, and then three items uh, deferred. Um, that number has stayed fairly consistent. So 2019 it was a little bit higher at three three and a half uh, was two and a half in 2017. So uh, we're hovering right around three as an aggregate average for those three time periods. And then percentage of items deferred on average, again, um, fairly consistent, again, hovering around uh, the 50 percentile. Um, so that's that's really the figure that I think should be um, a main focal point for us is um, reducing that percentage of items that are deferred um, meeting to meeting. And I, I want to step back for a second and just acknowledge that deferring items is not uh, necessarily bad. Um, you know, there, there are times when the commission needs additional information where a member of the public might raise an issue that we've not heard before, uh, where the applicant might ask for a deferral. So there are a number of different reasons why that might happen. Um, where it gets into um, a little bit more troubling territory is when items are deferred uh, more than twice. So more than two meetings, it continues to be carried over. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's extremely impactful. And that's something that uh, we're going to talk about a little bit further um, after we get past this slide. So one last uh, item of, uh, of summary here. So uh, I mentioned that your items, when they're deferred, typically held for new zoning conditions, additional information, things we haven't heard before. Um, we've heard it for the first time in public. And then uh, when items come back, generally there's additional discussion uh, when they appear back on your agenda under old business. So uh, looking, this is at the 2021 uh, January through April timeframe. I mentioned that you had 64 total items that were discussed. A vast majority of those items were introduced, discussed, and then decided in two meetings or less, meaning 
maybe it was deferred uh, once and then came back and decided. So that's 94% of your work, which is fantastic. Um, that's the way the process should work. Um, and if we look at the timeframes, I don't I believe I have this as a slide, but it's something that I, I reviewed, you know, your average date for decision uh, really is manageable. I mean, you're, you're hovering in the 30 day range, uh, which is fantastic. But that second row, the items held for more than two meetings, it's a very small percentage, you know, 6%, only four cases that were discussed for more than two meetings. So. I want to take a, a closer look at that because this data is um, eye opening. It was to me. So here are the four cases uh, that came back for more than two meetings. I'm sure you all had a good idea of what they were before I put the slide up, uh, but it was Z5020, Z3420, Z5320, and Z5720. And I've got in the parentheticals there, you know, th those were the locations or how we referred to those cases. Um, look at the, the second column. That was the total time spent. Um, in all of the meetings to discuss these four cases. So if you take all of that time uh, that was spent on these cases, that represents uh, almost six and a half hours of discussion time on four items. And if you look at that, it represents um, almost 24% of your total meeting time between January and April over the course of nine meetings. So uh, almost a quarter of your time spent on these four cases that continue to come back and, and become refined over time. So, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's not a, a high number of cases that uh, are deferred over and over again. But when that happens, it has, um, it has the ability and opportunity to really um, grind your business to a halt. So, just a, a couple of, of staff observations here as we were looking at the data. First, uh, Chairperson Fox alluded to this. You know, the virtual environment is adding time to our meetings. Uh, it's, it's difficult for all of us, staff included. Um, putting the meetings together uh, can be um, an interesting journey um, just from the back end, uh, back of house uh, uh, sort of things. There's a lack of visual cues uh, that happen. You know, right now I'm presenting to you and I don't see anyone's face. Um, I don't see anyone's eyes. It's hard for me to know um, if anyone's got a question or if they want to hear more information. Um, time to queue up speakers, uh, it takes more time. Uh, another staff observation here and looking at the data, is the continued rehearing of items adds time to your meeting. So, you know, good strategy here um, is to continue to remember, summarize what you've heard, focus on outstanding issues and, and really uh, try to get to a place where those outstanding issues can either be resolved or not. And if, if the answer is not, they can't be resolved, uh, then it would be appropriate just to take action on the case. So uh, I think this is my last uh, final point here. Um, you know, as we start to think about what in-person meetings might look like, uh, we again have a great opportunity to look at how we've operated in this virtual environment. And, and maybe there is an opportunity for us to to bring some of the good parts of uh, the virtual meeting into in-person meetings. So, you know, is, is it possible that we could still have virtual engagement or attendance at these meetings? Is it possible that uh, we just live stream our meetings and have a, a chat function with them? Um, those are all things that staff is, is discussing now uh, and hope that we can um, have a, a fuller conversation with the Planning Commission once we, we get to a point uh, where we believe we'll be returning in person. I think that was my last slide there. I'm going to stop sharing. And we can go back to any slide. If you have questions about any of that data, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Chairperson Fox. Thank you, Travis. Um, my biggest takeaway there, and just correct me if I'm if I'm interpreting this information incorrectly, is that the the change in our review time didn't we didn't necessarily we're not going to see an impact from that because we we are deciding cases in a smaller window than we thought the biggest impact that we feel is the length of our meetings is that an accurate statement that's a very succinct way to put it yes ma'am okay. i would fully agree with that okay so in um in preparing to take over the chair role, which there might have been a little bit of arm twisting behind the scenes, um, what I did was I started watching old planning commission meetings, um, which you can find on the city's website. And I think they go back as far as like 2014, 2013. 
Um, they actually go back further than that. Um, I found uh, one of the historical videos from 2008 when I was introduced as an employee to the Planning Commission. So they go way far back. So I'm going to have to look at that one, like sans beard. Um, so when, one thing I noticed, and you can just see this because it has a list of all the Planning Commission meetings, and then it has um, the time of the meeting, like the length of the meeting. And I noticed it tick up dramatically um, from like 2018 until now. And so that is why I requested we have a little bit of metrics behind like what, like what is that? Um, part of what I personally see is um, when a number of members of the community come in person and they know they have 10 minutes and they're all together in a room, they generally took the stance of organizing themselves and um, finding one speaker to take that 10 minutes versus in this digital environment, everybody's in their own home on a phone calling in, they don't have visual cues to each other. And so we we had to start setting a, a time clock um, and giving people, in my opinion, sometimes irrational um, moments of time, like you have a, a minute and 32 seconds to speak, right? Like what, what does that accomplish versus um, them having the opportunity to coordinate themselves and make comment? I found that that works, I think, to the community's benefit, and then it, it worked to at that time that planning commission's benefit as well. I don't know if anybody kind of has any comments on um, what Travis presented or if you have any observations you want to share. Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. And thank you for that, Travis, and thank you for requesting it, um, Roberta. I think that was great. Um, it was good to see. Um, and I, I really appreciated the slide that showed the four that we had spent the most time on, because I think that really underscored what um, Roberta. I'm hoping we can do first names today since we're going to just go for it. Okay. I'm, I'm a sweat um, pants. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> what you said earlier about giving a disproportionate amount of time to more affluent communities, because I mean, there it was right there in black and white. Look at where those were. Um, and I'm not saying that there weren't legitimate reasons for getting more information and coming back, but what it says to me is there are um, lower wealth communities that had the same issues um, in some rezonings, but they didn't get extra time to go back and hire somebody to reevaluate the traffic impact analysis. Even though the issues may have been the same, those four cases got six hours of our time. The outcome may or may not have been the same. So it just underscored for me what you had said and that we really do need to be aware of that. That some of them we're going, we're zipping right through them with the same issue. But if it's a wealthier community that has access to more resources, we may defer it and defer it and defer it. And, and that's just something to be aware of. So I, I really, I thought that was a great visual, so thank you for doing that. Can we get that presentation? Absolutely, I'd be thank happy you. to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Winters, and then I saw um, Commissioner Reigns. Okay, thank you. And just to uh, piggyback off of what um, Nicole said uh, about the, and this is, a, if you all haven't under, noticed by now, this is a soft spot for me when we're talking about equity across the board and the importance of, and I think for me, I'll just say this, that sometimes when we don't see the third party coming to intervene, uh, sometimes we'll say, well, we're not seeing any opposition, so there must not be opposition. And I don't think that's necessarily true. When we're talking about um, having the opportunity to phone in and take two hours to sit on the phone and wait, mm -hmm. I think that we should not take for granted just because no one is there doesn't mean that they don't care. Uh, the same way in terms of being present or access to internet or, or something like that. I think that we need to be very mindful of not making that notion, well, it must not be a problem. That if we're going to consider it an issue in one community, we need to give it the same weight in another just because they're absent or if they could not attend, we don't know the reasons behind that. And we should still continue to try to evaluate them the same. That's a good point. Um, Commissioner Reigns. 
And then, um, Travis, I saw your hand as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Travis. That was great information. And, and uh, to follow up what Commissioner Bennett mentioned on the four cases, I thought kind of definitely opened my eyes. I knew we spent a lot of time on it, didn't know it was that much. Um, one of the observations from those cases is that kind of dragged it on was that the applicant typically provided new information that wasn't in the packet to the mm -hmm. neighbors or the public that d made us review it and defer it uh, another another time. So if there's a way to kind of cut that off or, or, or provide some sort of process that, that doesn't allow that to happen, um, that may smooth out the, the overall review process. But that seemed to be a recurring issue with particularly one project, I remember. So thank you. Thank you. Travis? Sure, and I, I think um, those were both great comments, um, and I wanted to start out by addressing uh, Commissioner Winter's comment and then uh, Commissioner Raines. That was really good insight as well. So, Commissioner Winters, I, you're dead on in what you said. You know, just because no one's in the room doesn't mean there aren't issues uh, with uh, mm -hmm. a space, and, and maybe that's a product of people, you know, not being linked to information, not paying attention to information, not being able to come to meetings uh, when we have them. So that's really the whole idea behind our enhanced engagement strategy is to broaden the way that we reach out to people so we can hear from additional voices during um, these processes. So um, if someone can't show up at a planning commission meeting or a, a committee meeting or commission meeting, um, we have alternative means for them to engage with staff. So that, that's really what we're focused on. And I, I really do appreciate that comment. Um, and then Commissioner Raines, uh, your comment about um, you know, trying to curtail some of the um, the dripping of zoning conditions, if you will, and the the small incremental changes to cases. You know that that is um, the reason why uh, the last tech change that that you just saw, TC nineteen twenty, had uh, a couple of what I think are pretty impactful uh, changes included in it. One of which being that conditions change one time at planning commission. So you have the discussion, you hear from the public. Commission gets to weigh in, and then you can ask applicants, would you consider adding a condition that does A, B, and C? And then they can be deferred for a couple of weeks and then come back uh, with or without conditions. And then at that point, you should have a pretty good foundation to take action on the case. Um, so I, I think that's a, a really good enhancement. I know that the again, the um, truncating the, the review time seems very impactful, but two things here. One, the enhanced process should be really helpful and two, the data really hasn't borne out um, the thought that uh, shrinking down the time to 60 days even uh, will will cause a, a whole slate of uh, requests for time extensions. So uh, great comments there. Commissioner O'Haver, did I see your hand? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. A great morning. report, Travis. I love metrics. Thanks for making that available. I'm curious, could you add to that when you send that out if the information is available the total number of of rezoning cases that are submitted to the city for 2019, 2020, and I would just like to get a sense of the 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 full pipeline versus just the meetings that we've seen. But 64 cases in nine meetings seems like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I also found it interesting that the metric bore out that we were hearing most cases in less than 30 days. I wouldn't have guessed that. And I think it is the impact of those four that just beat the heck out of us. Um, but I, I would like to also say that along the lines of, um, you know, Shelly and Nicole and Roberta Dean's comments, I do think that staff getting more involved in those meetings and, and really sort of coming back to the planning commission and the city council with their reports there's going to be consistency along there i like ken's terms about it being dispassionate it's going to be the same amount of information that's pulled across and, and to shelly's point if people can't be at the pc meeting then we at least can trust that staff is there and, and trying to give a very honest opinion about what happened and so i know that's going to add a boatload of time for you all but i think hopefully if we get to that point i think that'll bear out some changes and then my last observation which i'm curious if anybody else sort of i kind of 
after the meeting had to shake my head in that last in your in your last um slide where we had nine cases that we got through <laughs> and only one i found it really interesting that two or three times we decided not to rehear the public or the applicant and we've never done that before we did it like two or three times and it i think that slide shows that we were able to get through and make decisions on things i'm not saying we should do that more often because I think there should be some sensitivity, especially now around making sure that we hear from the public. But I just kind of was surprised. And I, I think the slide shows that, you know, we crushed that agenda and we decided not <laughs> to hear back. And I was really, you know, surprised about that. So those are my thoughts. So um, I would like to say one more thing about the neighborhood meetings, just to correct something that was stated earlier. They, Links to those neighborhood meetings actually are public. You can go and um, you can go and watch, uh, even if you don't have uh, a direct invite. Um, the notice requirement is obviously a proactive notice to people to let them know what's going on. But if you want to scan the website to look for neighborhood meetings, you can do so. Um, but if you're not on those mailing lists to get the notice, you will obviously have to kind of check in from time to time to see if there's anything of interest. To check in on, but they are they are they are public, um, and we we know that you know uh, we've had requests from council members and others to know about them, and so we have we have started posting those on the website. Um, and again, we will look into the, the the potential role for staff for making sure that there's a, a complete and dispassionate record of what was said at those meetings. I think that would be a good advancement. Thank you for that, Mr. Bowers. Oh, Commissioner Bennett. Thank you, um, and I love how you, you all keep talking about dispassionate. Um, as you may know, that's not a virtue of mine. So I'm very passionate about things. So don't send me to the meetings to talk about everything. Um, to uh, Brian's point, you know, we did um, not allow comment at that last meeting. And while it was a very efficient agenda, I have to say that really hurt me when we didn't allow the public to speak. Not that I didn't care about the applicants, but I mean, the, the applicant sort of had presented their new conditions. We knew the new conditions. I just feel like if people, especially in this environment, have taken time out of their schedule, some have taken time off of work to show up, we should hear from them. And it just, it, it really bothered me to turn away public comment. Um, so, it was efficient. It was great. We got through nine items, but um, especially in the current environment, when it feels like they don't have other opportunities to to participate, to say we know you're on the line, but we're not going to hear from you. I hope we don't have to do that again. I hear I I hear your comment, um, Nicole. I and I was very cautious in approaching those in that those particular cases. I looked to see if it was the same exact people signed up from the previous one or two meetings. And I looked to see if we had also received email comment from them and we did in those cases. So, um, I don't, I don't think I would ever be in a situation where the 1st time hearing a case. That I would ever not hear from the public, um, but on a 3rd time. When I know it's the same people and I know I've read their email, I'm, I'm less inclined, not that it doesn't provide value, but it doesn't, it doesn't influence my decision making process at that point, because I, I have that information. And I know my job is to make it is to evaluate and make a decision at, at that place. But right. I, do, I do think it is important, important, but that brings up a good, um, a good point. So. The, some of those cases, I, I'm, they, they did have the similarity that you noted earlier, um, and, but the other ones, I think, were related to, um, the, to traffic. So, I mean, we've all seen, like, the, the bingo card meme on what people are going to say at a planning commission meeting. So, uh, I, and I'm not, I'm not making light of it, but just to, it, there are common themes, right? So, it's... Um, it's it's massing, it's density, or it's impacts, and those impacts are uh, stormwater, traffic, etc. 
it, it's it's a it's like a common theme. But if we if we keep seeing the same type of project and the same type of impact that's disproportionately distributed around the community, at that point, I think we have an opportunity um, to provide recommendations for policy changes. So when we see those in the future, we're evaluating them at a different time or in a different way. So we've changed the lens by which we look through them and the lens by which they're evaluated in the staff report if if we can influence the, the policy piece of it. Am I making sense? I've stunned you all into silence. Okay. Anyway, um, did, did I see another hand pop up while I was speaking? Okay, that's your winners. Thank you. Uh, and Travis, again, thank you. I didn't give the proper thank you for that wonderful presentation because, again, seeing it really does help illuminate and, and make it more make it make more sense. Um, and forgive me, I just want to backtrack just one step, one second, and not trying to beat a horse, but something occurred to me that was said when we're talking about um, less affluent minority communities. Um, and I just want to put this in your forefront as we're considering it, because almost saying, well, um, when people don't come for whatever reason, uh, it's almost equivalent to saying, for instance, the black community doesn't trust medicine, but that's taking the statement, the, the concept out that medicine has not been kind to people of color. So also looking at it in the lens of where minorities have come to speak, they have not, there's also the history of not being heard and their concerns not being um, implemented uh, and that also leads to a sense of frustration, which may also be a block to um, access. So being mindful of that as well, I think is important to give voice to um, and, and to consider another hurdle or, or how we incorporate to try to overcome that hurdle um, of, of hearing and implementing as a, in, in, um, in versus other communities that expect to be heard and they expect for the implementation to occur. That's a good comment. Thank you, Shelley. Um, does anyone have any additional comments on this one? Commissioner Bennett. Um, regarding the fact that a lot of these have traffic issues, um, something else we can do, and um, Roberta, you did this at the last meeting is when it first appears, if we see that traffic is a big issue, we can refer it to the transportation committee. And that way we don't get bogged down in the regular PC meetings talking about it. Um, so that's something that I know Roberta, you look at as you see the cases first coming, I'll try to pay more attention to that as well. But, you know, Travis or Ken, if, if one of you noticed that and you know, traffic is a big thing with it. Um, we can just send it to the transportation committee and try to deal with that, that issue there. And maybe that will streamline the process a little bit as well. That's a good point. And, and we're kind of like flowing into the meeting management part of the agenda, which is kind of, I think is an appropriate time to do that. Um, and my intent here, just to be clear, is not, you know, maximum efficiency at the um, that the loss of the community, it's, it's to be quite frank, I think um, we need to protect ourselves. We experience fatigue when we get three plus hours into a meeting. I've, I've noticed it's challenging for us to stay engaged. So I feel like we are able to give people better deliberation amongst ourselves. Um, when we have moments of rest. <laughs> so, so some of these cases, um, which I do think, um, I do think it warrants the additional conversation. It's not to say those cases that Travis picked out, we, we, we shouldn't have spent those six hours, but we might be able to distribute those hours amongst different meetings. And so my thought behind that, there's, there's two thoughts. I mean, division of labor is kind of a, primary concept behind industrialized nations. Like otherwise we'd all be grinding our own wheat or milking our own cows, right? So uh, we 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 distribute we distribute things throughout the society and we have to trust each other throughout the committee structure to be able to do that. So the four or five members focus on that and they spend an entire hour on just one case and really focus on it. 
I trust that those members are going to bring to that conversation things that I would have brought if I'm not there. Although I do have the opportunity to call in because all of the meetings are public. I, I do have the opportunity to talk to commission members before the meeting to 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 let them know what my my concerns might be. Um, but I do think it's an opportunity as well to to split across time times of day that we're having meeting and engaging people. So. It's challenging for a lot of people to even call in for a meeting on a Tuesday morning between 9 and 12. And our committee meetings, for the most part, specifically transportation and um, text change occur later in the day. So those are generally around 4 o'clock. So you might be able to encourage um, a different different members of our community to be able to call in at that time. And then, you know, subsequently, like after after we hear the case, we make a recommendation that goes to city council. There's a public hearing, which is generally like 7 p.m. onwards. So I feel like hitting different points of the day only only allows more access to occur. Um, and at our committee meetings, um, we are allowed to have general public comment as well. And so it's it's a it's another opportunity. Even if an item is not on an agenda, we can we can make note of um, if someone's signed up and wants to speak on something. Um, I think Travis, did you have information on this particular topic? Um, any metrics? Um, no metrics on this, um, and I, I appreciate the introduction and the conversation. So staff doesn't have any prepared uh, information here. This is a, a good topic. However, you know, we, we do have 4 different subcommittees. Um, historically, uh, 2 of those subcommittees have been very active committee of the whole and text change. And then planning commission does the bulk of the work. Um, it wasn't until a few years ago that the transportation committee and strategic planning committee really started to meet with a little bit more regularity, uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, to your point, um, dividing the work up amongst the different subcommittees is really the reason why we have the, the subcommittee structure. Uh, it mirrors what the, the city council has for uh, their subcommittee structure. Now, I know that um, it, it might uh, give folks some pause uh, because the subcommittees are um, populated by four or five different uh, commission members. And so it's not the full group that has to have the full discussion in the committee. Um, I'd note a couple of different things. Uh, Chairperson Fox raised this one. Even though you're not a member of a committee doesn't mean you can't go to it. So, for instance, if you don't sit on the text change committee, you always have an open invitation to attend a text change committee meeting and listen, deliberate, communicate, uh, whatever you want. Uh, so that's that's the 1st point. The 2nd point is items are always going to, to come back to the planning commission um, and uh, the planning commission will take a, a vote on any of uh, the business. So there is opportunity to have conversations um, with the commit committee members. There's opportunities to have a uh, conversation at the full planning commission meeting. Uh, so um, I think just from an engagement standpoint, it's a, a pretty rich environment there for you. Um, and second thing, and this is a really specific um, point, uh, but I think it's uh, an important one. You know, we as a staff, we're talking about um, the committee structure and, and how to best utilize the committee structure. And I can't take credit for this idea. I'm going to give it to Ken, but, you know, the transportation committee, as its name sounds, um, uh, you would think is focused solely on transportation. Um, so if there are cases that have a wider impact on not just transportation, but infrastructure uh, might be a good environment for uh, for that discussion. So we, we were batting around the idea of potentially renaming that committee the infrastructure committee or some sort of infrastructure focus. So it's not focused solely on transportation. So for instance, if there were issues of stormwater uh, that could be discussed in committee, if there were issues about traffic, transit, transportation, obviously those those would be um, uh, good candidates as well or utility issues. So it would broaden um, the range of discussion topics for that committee. It's something that was intriguing to me um, and, and would love to hear feedback on that from the full planning commission, especially uh, Commissioner Bennett. And I, just to uh, piggyback on that, I think the the original structure of the committees was really oriented more towards um, 
policy questions. But one of the results is that those policy questions are very infrequently in front of the commission. So most of the committees are mostly not meeting most of the year. And um, that has a, tended to burden the committees with a more specific purpose like text change. Um, I, so I think the infrastructure is a good idea. I think the, the strategic plan committee has historically been used for uh, comp plan amendments and area plans and things of that nature. But you know, when you look at the structure of the staff report, what's it analyzing? It's analyzing consistency with the plan and it's analyzing um, impacts to infrastructure. Uh, and uh, so I think an infrastructure committee covers half of that. Strategic plan could be a venue for cases where the issues revolve around consistency with city policy. How does this fit within the overall growth framework for the city? Um, you know, I think there's other issues, obviously, that the public brings up that are not under not in those two buckets that just kind of relate to um, uh, uh, the impacts of change on the on the uh, built form of the community or or things of that nature. Um, but most of those, I think, are 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 talked about under the rubric of the city's policies. So it's the comp plan that's obviously chock a block with policies that talk about land use compatibility and neighborhood change, et cetera. So. Um, I, I also just want to piggyback on your remark here, Fox, about the accessibility of the committee meetings. The other advantage they have, other than the time, is that the agendas are typically one or two items. So you're not sitting for two hours uh, waiting to speak, which I think it's also takes some of the burden off of the citizens in order to, to be able to participate because it's a much more focused discussion with just one or two cases on the agenda. Um, I do think the, the other thing is related to accessibility is Hopefully, what we saw with the text change portal was in the old days you would get you would get um, essentially uh, three categories of people who would who would uh, talk at text change committee meetings or at the planning commission about text changes. People with the industry who are supportive of the change, people from the industry who didn't like the change, and members of the public who didn't like the change. And there's a fourth category that suddenly showed up on the text change portal that we'd never heard from before, which was members of the public who liked the change. You know, they may not have a particular economic interest in it. They may not be planning to actually take advantage of themselves, but they think it's a change for the better. And they weren't going to take time out to talk at the meeting about it, but they would take time out to post a comment on a on an online forum about it. And I thought that was very interesting. And I think you know we may see some of that as well um, uh, in the rezoning portal and, and hearing from people who normally don't attend those meetings. Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. I think those are great ideas. Um, I'm happy to take those on in the committee. Um, I might suggest, I think, guess infrastructure is so all inclusive and it might require a lot of education, maybe something like mobility and infrastructure because it keeps the, the, the moving. The transportation element, I, I didn't understand transportation is it's kind of narrow. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, in planning the mobility being used instead of, you know, transportation or traffic, maybe mobility and infrastructure. It would still include the stormwater and utilities and all those other um, items that you're talking about, but still maintaining the moving of people element. But I, I think it's a great idea. I'm happy to take it on. I might need a little support when we're getting in the weeds of stormwater and utilities because that's really not my background. So, <laughs> um, but I can certainly facilitate a meeting and bring other people in to talk about those things. Well, you know, the planning commission is at its heart a lay board. You know, there's not a requirement for you to be a civil engineer or an architect to sit on it. I know, but I'm just OCD like we, that. I don't want to be able to do anything about it. <laughs> but where I'm going with this is that the other point of the specialization of the committees is the committee members, you know, get more educated on those topics, even if that's not their educational or professional background. Um, and it's unreasonable to expect every planning commissioner to become an expert in every type of thing, but it is reasonable if you sit on the infrastructure committee to learn more about stormwater systems. And, um, you know, and I think that that is another benefit of the specialization that Chair Fox talked. And we do, and we have existing committee structure, um, the potential to rename to mobility and infrastructure, which I wholeheartedly support. Um, 
and I've not not recommended a substantial amount of changes to membership on the committees. Um, most of that had to do with the fact that some of you I only know from this format. <laughs> so, um, but if I um, do reach out, um, it, if there are issues or you want to be considered or you want to shift responsibilities or what, whatever the case may be. Um, and we can um, send out again um, what the current committee assignments are and um, when those meeting times are. I see Travis nodding. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, just one, we, we, we would be happy to do that. And one quick comment. I know that um, the idea here about farming cases off to subcommittees is, is probably new. Um, and I fully appreciate that. Um, this is all coming from the spirit of uh, trying to assist you all in getting through this giant workload um, issue that you have. Um, so understanding that you've heard this essentially for the first time today, um, and I, I don't wanna surprise anyone with it. So um, the, the function of changing a committee name happens through your bylaws. So you've got a, a series of planning commission bylaws. Um, and so if we wanted to change uh, the focus of a committee um, or change the name of it, uh, or give more structure in the bylaws, we would need to review them, uh, revise them, and recommend a change to them to the city council, and they officially would adopt them. So uh, it's not as easy as flipping a switch uh, and then starting um, uh, from scratch. So if we can talk about this towards the end uh, when we get to kind of follow up items uh, for staff. Uh, but if that is the will of the commission, we could start the process to amend the bylaws and then present them to you. Uh, so it will give you a little more time to absorb this. Uh, and it also gives you a little bit more time and space. You don't have to settle on a name that maybe you don't really like today um, and maybe tomorrow come up with a better one. So uh, just again, be, be aware of that. If we get to the end of the meeting and this is the will of the, the commission that uh, staff will put the, the um, changes in process and you'll see it again. Commissioner Miller, did you have a comment? Yes, uh, I think Nicole made a good point, and I, I just wanted to add, she may have joined the planning commission, or it may have been right before that. Um, I was on the transportation committee, and Jason Myers provided a great um, presentation at that time about what the city's policy is with respect to traffic and transportation, but traffic in particular. So, um, and I was very surprised and interested to learn that the goal is not to have um, as little traffic as possible in all places that the goal of the city is actually very strategic and you know in order to avoid sprawl we actually try to one of the most effective tools we have there is to encourage um, traffic and, and level of services f and, and that kind of thing in certain areas um, and I just thought that was incredibly helpful and insightful, but I know that was that was early on when I first joined. We've had many people join since then. Um, so but the presentation's already was, might, might be worth taking that out and adding that to the agenda at some point. Thank you for that. That that predated me as well. I've not I've not seen that. Um, one of the um, Commissioner Haver, go ahead. I was just going to I was sort of thinking through that when Nicole was talking earlier, like again put more on staff but it it seems like if we're going to be taking on more in those committees and dealing with policy and how it relates to the comp plan that it does seem like there's a role for staff to again add more work but to really support the subcommittee and really kind of lay out what the requirements and responsibilities and strategies are to assist because if the idea because i know nicole and i've talked about this before about policies that we're we're bumping up against and how we change those and how we consider them and understanding what the policies are i think the subcommittees would be an opportunity to do that but again it's just a little bit just a little bit more on staff thanks brian i was going to note um one of the reasons i wanted to look at how we used the committees is um in that review and watching old planning commission meetings, which I recommend if you're an insomniac as well. Um, I'm recalling, um, I wanna say it was when Eric Braun was chair and Travis, you can correct me, 
um, they kept seeing a number of cases come up where one commission member was um, requesting transit easements or transit shelters or and it and it wasn't being applied consistently. And so they took that issue of transit transit shelter and they put it in the transportation committee. And I believe that committee actually developed the text change, which now requires that for new development. Is that correct? That's right. So I thought that was a really effective way to use the committee. So there's a there's a, a an issue that comes up consistently, um, finding a solution to that versus um, us just talking around it on on every individual case. And so the solutions that we have here in this work are policy change recommendations, which would show up in the comprehensive plan. And then um, regulatory changes, which would show up in the unified um, development ordinance. So, so um, anyway, that that was part of the part of the rationale behind it. Um, I can't I can't entirely take credit for that. Um, did I see someone's hand while I was yammering? No. Okay. Oh, Commissioner Miller. Um, I was just thinking about the academy that's being put together for. The applicants and honestly, I'd be thrilled to look at that material as well. But then it also reminded me when I was just talking about the presentation on transportation policy for the city. Um, if there's some place that we could aggregate those types of presentations, that is sort of a, a 101, you know, especially if they happen in some of these committees, it was helpful there, but the full planning commission didn't see that one. And I know it has informed my thinking on a, and, and decision making at the commission level a ton. In terms of you know someone says there's no traffic and I'm like well but remember the presentation you know said that that's okay that we want traffic there um, just kind of get, making sure that if we have some of these interesting and educational meetings in the committee in the committees if we could aggregate those in some place that's accessible for us and then also for um, the general public as well that's a great idea are there any other um, any other comments on this one. I'm kind of I'm going to shift us a little bit if it's OK to um, talk about staff reports. Um, feels like that might be the appropriate time. Um, Travis, I think you were going to walk through a typical staff report and, and help us understand how those are developed. Yes, ma'am, I'd be happy to. So um, this was a, a question that was raised you when know, we had an open call for topics um, just about how Staff reports are put together and it was really, I think the comment really was focused on um, how consistency is arrived at um, by staff. So I'm just gonna take a, a high level overview. Again, I've got a, a pretty short slide deck I'll walk through um, about how staff uh, puts together a, a staff report, how they review a case, how consistency is determined. I know we've got a couple of uh, staff members on um, the call today would welcome them uh, to of course correct me if I've um, said anything that's off base because I'll admit it's been quite some time before I've put together a staff report. Uh, so if I get something wrong, I, I would welcome uh, any correction from either Carmen or Matt. So give me one second to bring back my presentation. Hold on one second. Do y'all see anything right now? I'm not seeing anything on my screen. We we are, we are seeing a, a black void. Yeah, yeah that's not, should be. Is that black good? voids are, are never good. Let's see if I can restart the presentation, uh, and we'll go from there. Give me one more second. Y'all keep vamping while I'm bringing it up. So now I think it's the appropriate time to list our grievances about Mr. Crane. That's <laughs> right. That's a perfect time for that. Uh, no, I, I appreciate you um, going through this. Um, obviously, I'm, I've read many of these things, but um, I'm not one who has developed them personally. Um, it has opened my eyes to many comp plan policies that I that had not been on my radar previously. There you go. I see it, Travis. Sure thing. 
Yay, look at that. Uh, let me get to the right place. Display this correctly. All right. There we go. So, as I mentioned, um, just that this will be a high level overview of um, how staff reviews a case, uh, just kind of the, um, you know, the back room, back room's a bad term, uh, behind the scenes uh, staff analysis um, and the way that cases are formulated and then ultimately delivered to you for deliberation. So, um, as you know, staff is, planning staff is the primary these staff reports. Um, uh, we have a large number of comprehensive planners that are number one, extremely talented, and we don't thank them enough for doing what they do. Um, but they are the, uh, the point of contact here and are responsible for gathering all the information, researching, uh, putting all the information together, and then ultimately delivering it to you and to the city council. Um, the staff review not only involves the planning staff, but many other staff members in what we call our matrix departments, uh, other development related departments that provide comment for us. So um, our planning staff is, is generally uh, running around trying to wrangle other departments to get comments, feedback, information, et cetera. So they're um, extremely skilled and talented at doing that. Uh, staff report really Two first is potential requests, uh, and two is any outstanding issues and, and um, related to policy analysis. So um, we'll kind of hit on two major questions here. Number one is how is consistency determined and, and what might be changing in our staff reports here in the near future? So I mentioned that staff reports are a multidisciplinary effort. Um, you see different subsections from our Department of Transportation, from stormwater, uh, historic development staff who are embedded in the planning department, parks and recreation staff, generally related to greenways and parks. Uh, Public Utilities provides information, as does transit and urban forestry. And the review that happens uh, obviously is collaborative with all these different departments and divisions, but it's continuous. So as cases evolve, as you know, uh, that happens uh, quite often with, with zoning requests. Um, the cases continue to evolve either through uh, change to zoning districts that are requested through zoning conditions that are offered. And that changes the review of staff. So, it, uh, you know, a slight change to a zoning condition could involve a number of different departments and really change uh, the outcome of development on the site. So that's the reason why we continue to collaborate uh, with all of these departments. Uh, throughout the lifespan of the case. So I mentioned there, there are two real primary outcomes of our staff report here. First is the impact of the request, meaning uh, the request is from X to Y zoning district. You know, what is the impact of that? Uh, what generally would we see as, a, as an impact? And it's usually related to development intensity. Uh, second is consistency of the request with the comprehensive plan. Um, as you all know, uh, that is something that's stated very clearly in state law, and that's the uh, city council must find uh, whether or not a request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and whether or not it is reasonable on the public interest. And um, I want to step back and thank you all. I know that over the course of the past year, uh, the commission as a whole has really adjusted to uh, consistency um, findings uh, for each of our zoning cases. I know it's it's difficult uh, and sometimes it feels like a, a strange language when you start to make a motion uh, and the bright lights of the camera are on you and, and you um, are struggling to find the, the correct words there. Uh, so I, I will just forecast there is some help on the way for you uh, there. That's a, a little nugget to give you um, to, to keep you interested in this presentation. Uh, so I mentioned that there is that requirement for you know, something that's reasonable in the public interest in. Oftentimes, that, that's something that is incorporated into your motions. So, I mentioned that the impact is one of the primary points of analysis here. It's, it's really looking at changes to regulations um, as a result of this request. So, how will the entitlement change? Meaning, um, you know, how much can be built on a site? So, you know that different zoning districts carry with them different, what I'll call baskets of uses. Uh, meaning that there's a different suite of uses allowed in one zoning district to the next. Uh, that really is one of the primary points of impact, uh, but also the, the zoning districts carry with them development standards, uh, such as your minimum building setbacks, your building height and how tall a building can be. 
uh, and lots of other different physical uh, parts of the site development. Um, another part of this is, you know, what's required with any development. So are there things like um, uh, tree conservation areas or buffers? Um, what type of minimum parking will be required? This is all part of the analysis that staff performs uh, using a pretty supercharged spreadsheet uh, that we've purchased uh, that gives us a, a guesstimate about how uh, developed a property can be. So looking at that second portion, main portion of staff reports um, related to consistency, um, this is offered by staff and it's based on an analysis of adopted policies in our comprehensive plan. And you know that we have a number of different um, chapters, what we call elements in the comprehensive plan that focus on um, different uh, areas or issues. So like land use or transportation or environmental protection. Uh, consistency here uh, is an analysis of not only the policies, but of maps included as a part of uh, the comprehensive plan. So you're all well aware of the future land use map, which is a primary point of analysis by staff. Uh, there's also an urban form map and other various maps scattered throughout the document uh, that are analyzed if, um, if appropriate. Um, one key point here is that not all of the policies within the comprehensive plan are reviewed with every zoning case. So staff looks at what we call key policies and at the bottom of the screen here, you see two um, examples. You know, the first on the left hand side, the placemaking uh, is what we call an aspirational policy. It's something that uh, if implemented through zoning is nice. It's a, it's a good gold star for the application and it would be cited uh, if an application implemented this policy or was consistent with this policy it would be uh, LEU 2.1 would be listed uh, under the, the um, list of consistent policies. Contrast that to the policy on the right, LEU 2.6. So the first thing you see here is it's got that yellow or orange dot at the very beginning. Uh, that is your indicator that this is a key policy. So key policies will um, be analyzed by staff uh, regardless of request. And uh, the key policy, if found inconsistent, will be listed as an inconsistent policy. So you can see uh, the, the tenor of the policy language between LU 2.1 and LU 2.6. Uh, you know, 2.1, if you read through uh, that, uh, those few sentences, you know that uh, it is much more aspirational uh, in nature. You know, aggregate uh, the spaces that in ag aggregate meet the needs of people at all stages of life. That's, that's pretty hard to quantify uh, through a zoning condition or through a zoning case. You know, contrast that to LU 2.6, you know, carefully evaluate all zoning amendments uh, for the impacts to infrastructure. So uh, it, again, the language uh, is directing us to, to really take a hard look at uh, how the, uh, the rezoning might impact infrastructure uh, that's on the ground. So when all of these key policies are analyzed, uh, staff looks at this as um, what I'll call a spectrum here. So take as an example, um, you know, if there are multiple inconsistent policies that are listed in a staff report, that doesn't mean that the case will automatically be inconsistent overall. Instead, what staff does is look at areas of inconsistency. And, and in that case, the analysis might result in an inconsistent determination. And I'll explain a little bit further what that means. So here in the example, you know, staff has identified five policies as, as inconsistent and another 10 are deemed consistent. So you can see a pretty um, even split, one third to two third there in total policies reviewed. Future land use map has been deemed consistent, uh, but all five inconsistent policies are related to land use compatibility in section 3.5 of the comprehensive plan. So that's one category, uh, one section, one very specific section of the comprehensive plan because only one category of policies are inconsistent. Staff might not find the case inconsistent overall. Now compare that to this example where again, five policies as uh, have been deemed inconsistent, another 10 deemed consistent. Uh, future land use map has been deemed consistent. So same fact pattern as the last example, but the five inconsistent policies here are related to multiple sections of the comprehensive plan. So land use compatibility, mixed use development, 
commercial districts and corridors, land use and transportation coordination. So that's a, a wider range of inconsistency across uh, multiple chapters of the comprehensive plan. And because there are five, what I'll call categories of policies here, uh, staff might find that this is an inconsistent case. So, you know, at face value, you might think, well, the cases are identical. It's 10 uh, consistent policies, five inconsistent future land use map uh, is um, has been deemed consistent. Why, why is there a difference? And the answer here is, it's that uh, the spectrum of inconsistency across multiple chapters of the comprehensive, comprehensive plan. So um, another point I'd make here is that uh, staff is not performing this work in a vacuum. Uh, there is peer review that happens with the staff reports. Uh, consistency is discussed amongst their peers. The language, the actual re um, report is reviewed by another staff member where they make comments. Uh, and in the spirit of collegiality, I, I think that's this has been a great um, improvement for our staff reports because now uh, you're seeing staff reports that almost feel uh, like they're coming from a singular voice, uh, which is something that, quite honestly, plagued us a number of years ago. Um, it was you could take the name off a staff report, but it could be made pretty apparent, um, you know, who was writing a staff report uh, based on uh, what was seen in the report. Um, that I think has greatly improved in the last uh, few years. Uh, and one of the, the reasons for that is this, um, this enhanced peer review. I'd also note that the planning manager reviews all of the staff reports and they, uh, the planning manager uh, will look at consistency and uh, ensure that policies are being applied appropriately. And then finally, uh, I know you've heard us say this before, uh, but I'll continue to reinforce the point, you know, staff provides the determination of consistency but planning commission, city council, members of the public can all disagree. Uh, so even if staff has identified a case as um, our analysis shows it as being consistent, um, you don't have to agree with that. And that, that happened fairly recently, uh, which I, I really do appreciate. I, it, I want to make sure that the commission understands it's not hurtful uh, to staff. You don't hurt our feelings. Um, you know, instead, what you're doing is finding a different uh, set of facts or policies that are applied. Um, and, um, you know, using your own judgment, determining whether or not a case is consistent. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, in the same vein, the city council can uh, also disagree with the staff report, with the planning commission uh, recommendation. Members of the public can disagree with any one of the three entities there. So uh, it really is an open forum for discussion and analysis of consistency there. And with that, I will stop sharing, stop talking and take any questions and also invite um, again uh, either Matt or Carmen to correct me if I've misstated anything there and I'll turn it back over to you chairperson Fox thank you Mr. Crane um, that was really helpful I do I wanted to stress that point to um, personally I review the staff report um, as a data point um, it's like a cliff notes but it's not it's not my instructions on what I'm supposed to do and so I, I think that's the best way to think about it. Um, I don't know if anybody had any questions. Did you did you cover Travis? Um, any of the other changes that we might see? We had talked about the equity analysis um, in committee at one point. Um, yes, and thank you for that reminder. Um, so that's one thing that you will see starting, I think, with the next round of staff reports. Um, the equity analysis that has been discussed uh, by the Planning Commission will be introduced into the staff reports, which uh, should be a, a welcome addition. Um, and I believe you'll start to see that on May 11th with your next agenda. Um, Excellent. Items that are on your consent agenda. So one thing, um, one thought that I had when we look at those equity analyses as, they, as we start seeing those come in, um, Something that shows a disproportionate impact um, from an equity standpoint, that might be something that we flag as requiring additional conversation that might be appropriate to put in committee, much like when we see something that we deem like doubly inconsistent, um, we automatically by practice send that to committee of the whole. Um, I just, I, I was thinking of, I'm going to have to start reviewing those equity analysis components of the report to see if that might be a good indicator of when something also goes to a committee. Um, this just 
It's kind of a thought on the fly. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Crane? That one, Mr. O'Haver. Um, I think it would be great. I wonder what y'all think. I'm, I'm looking at a staff report now with a plethora of both consistent and inconsistent policies, but nowhere does it say which ones are key and which ones mm -hmm. are aspirational. And so I think if there were either some kind of cheat sheet or if maybe in the staff report we could identify those, I think that would be helpful. Um, and secondly, and I'll, maybe we can get this at the end of the meeting, um, I think somehow, and I think the, the planning academy can help with this, but if there's some abbreviated way to present what you just went through in the meetings, I think it would be incredibly helpful to the public. Because quite frankly, I didn't know how you determine consistency and I'm sort of in the business, so to speak. And so what you just went through really just changed my perspective and I'm looking at a staff report and now listening to what you said, things are becoming more clear to me now that I was confused about. So if there's any way prior to the planning academy that we could provide that in a meeting or if maybe it's just for controversial cases where we're taking extended periods of time, maybe not for everyone, just a thought. And then third, maybe we can get into later um, and I fully appreciate, Travis, you saying that it's okay to disagree with staff, but there have been a couple of occasions where I've really had to bite my tongue with the public lashing at planning staff, just saying, you are absolutely wrong. You don't know what you're doing. I mean, Jason Harden took a beating in Midtown, and it was frustrating, and that's not fair, and I, at some point, Point, I want to be able to defend staff. I mean, it's okay for us to disagree, but in my mind, when that happens, it's someone coming into my place of work and saying to me, you're not qualified to do this. You don't know what you're doing, and I know your job better than you. That's different than saying I disagree with you and I, I see things differently, but sometimes public gets up there, and I, I just, I don't know, somehow I would like to make sure that the public also realizes that Jason was the point person that there are multiple people reviewing this throughout the city that the the planning, what did you say? Who was the other person? The planning manager reviews it. It was peer reviewed. And anyways, that's just that's bothered me. I've had to bite my tongue. And I for any of the staff members who are on the call, totally appreciate and value the amount of work that goes into this. And somehow I would like to be able to again, allow people to disagree, but just some, there's been a handful of occasions. I just think it's been unfair and I would like to put a stop to that, but we can either talk about that now or later. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. Well, Brian, you stole a lot of my comments, so <laughs> I'll be a lot briefer. Um, Travis, thank you for that. That was really, really, really helpful. Um, just, yeah, it, it, it helped my thinking, um, and a couple of things I had jotted down just to reinforce what Brian just said was this should definitely be part of the planning academy. Um, mm -hmm. this should be part of like a, some sort of academy or something for new planning commission members as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe, maybe it could be added to the, the commission webpage. So people can look at it um, and, and see, because I think um, I also like Brian's idea of highlighting key policies. I mean, that would help me. It would also help the public. But to Brian's point about sometimes getting, you know, members of the public who are a little less than, I guess, gracious in their comments, um, I think sometimes that comes from a place of not understanding. I'm certainly not justifying the way they attack sometimes, I, but I think it comes from not understanding and feeling like staff is making a judgment call about what is and what's not important 
in their neighborhood. And while that isn't necessarily going to change, I think it's helpful to understand, well, staff was really assigning a higher weight to these key policies, or this was considered consistent because all the inconsistent policies were in one area and not multiple areas. I feel like that maybe might dilute the vitriol a little bit if they just, they understand it. Um, because I know one case, I don't, maybe it was lead mine where we were getting the emails with these attachments and they were going through every policy. It's not consistent with this. It's not consistent with this, but you know, if we have had known this, well, these aren't considered key. These are more aspirational. I, I think it, it can, it can help. Um, a little, I think it can help a lot because this really helped me a lot and I really appreciate that presentation. So, so thank you. I think I'm getting a note that um, um, maybe Ira wants to make a comment about staff reports. Yeah, he does. Before he does, um, could I add one final point here that I, I should have mentioned during the presentation? I apologize um, that it wasn't listed there. Um, and first of all, thanks for all y'all's comments. Appreciate it. Um, you know, we don't um, we don't enter into this profession to you know get um, praise. Quite honestly, uh, and it's not very common. So I get that, and I, I appreciate the comments. Um, so one of the things that I didn't mention was that um, in making motions, um, you know, we have previously put together a motion template for for your assistance. We're going to take that a step further, um, and uh, we're going to start including consistency statements like uh, you would see in the city council agenda. Uh, and we'll, we can talk about this in, in greater detail. It uh, doesn't have to be today, but uh, talk to you all about how uh, you would reference those documents. Um, and you, again, certainly don't have to agree with, with documents. What staff plans on doing is giving you uh, companion documents for every case. Uh, one, um, a recommendation to approve a case. One, a recommendation to deny. Uh, each full of reasons why uh, you would do one or the other. Um, you can certainly add or subtract to any of those documents as you see fit. But again, it should be a, a really good uh, starting point for you. So I'll stop talking and turn it over to Ira, who I think wants to talk. Hi, good, af good afternoon. Sorry to butt in. I see Shelly laughing because she knows I can't help myself. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so two points just to, that I don't think Travis covered. The first is, you know, you are seeing a new section in the staff board of equity. Um, there will be a time where policy does not reflect that just because we are actively working on the equity update to the comp plan. So you'll get more information, but there won't be corresponding policies that say um, consistent or not, because we still have to write those. And that'll take a public process and probably, you know, a couple months worth of work. Um, the other thing, which I don't think Travis mentioned is, you know, the, the perspective of a case planner is really what's in the zoning. So a lot of times, you know, developers will say they're going to do one thing or another. Um, but if it's not reflected in the zoning, either as a condition or some other, like just in the UDO, it is really hard to, to tie a policy to that, you know, because a developer may sell the property the day after it gets rezoned. So we are really looking at the rules that change. Um, and to that effect, uh, you know, a request for, let's say, a neighborhood mixed use or NX district might trigger a policy if the zoning today is R10, but would not if the zoning today were OX or something. Because we're really looking at not only what's in the zoning, but what's changing in the zoning. Um, so, like the delta between, you know, the request and the existing conditions. Um, and that, will be the case even if the property today is vacant, right? And the and the public is really concerned about what's going to be there. And they're looking at, well, today there's nothing, there's trees or a grassy field, and they want to build a, a, a you know a convenience store. Well if the zoning today lets them build an office building, that that's that, that's staff perspective, which is really goes back to like Travis was talking about the spreadsheet, like what can be put here. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that sometimes policies pop up, like the, re the re request for the final zoning might be the same, but if the if what can be built today is different, that may or may not influence whether or not a policy gets flagged. 
as relevant to the case. So I hope that was helpful. That was helpful. Thank you, Ira. And I know Travis mentioned all the cases are appearing more like they're in the same voice, but um, secret side information, I can always tell which ones you've written. <laughs> um, Commissioner Bennett, did you have a comment? I did. I forgot the most important one was thank you for the equity section that's coming. Um, I know you all were probably working on it before I got on the commission, but you know it was almost a year ago when I first mentioned it. And so I appreciate you the hard work you put into it, and I'm really, really looking forward to seeing it. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and just say thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Miller, did you have a comment? Did I see your hand? Yes, to Travis's point and to the staff report and consistency statements, um, I, I think Nicole mentioned there's several times on some of the more controversial cases where um, the neighbors will put together a point by point um, piece that sort of tries to, to rebut the staff's present or staff report in terms of the consistency statements. And, you know, as, as a lawyer, I can't sort of help myself. I'm always like, well, these are the two arguments. Do you want a chance to respond to that? I'm about, you know, by staff. Um, and I have sometimes asked staff for that. I don't want to create additional work for staff that you have to respond to every time an applicant does something like that. And at the same time, I feel like it's helpful in our role trying to evaluate and adjudicate these things to have a response to that. But it's also helpful to the general public to understand um, why staff made those positions and also defend those positions um, and provide this additional insight, like the, the kind that we got in this presentation. And so what, I'm wondering what might be the best way to provide that response from staff without necessarily creating um, a policy that, that creates unnecessary or inappropriate additional work for staff. Travis or Ken, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Well, I think that kind of depends on whether you want it in writing <laughs> or not. I mean, are you looking for a response from staff at the at the podium as to what we think of the applicant's argument? I, th I think what has been, um, I think part, part of our, part of our reluctance to engage in what appears to be an argument with the applicant is that we're not representing a side, right? Um, right. Uh, it's not like we're on team and consistent and trying to d defend our team from the applicant who's on team consistent and trying to put the strongest case out there. Um, we've given you our opinion. We put it in some detail in the staff report. They've disputed it and we're expecting you to decide what Version you think is more compelling. I mean, I, I guess, um, I mean, I guess we could we could elaborate further if we feel like there's further information that might be relevant to you as to why staff made the recommendation on the consistency that we did. But I, I, I just feel like it puts us in a position that's that is outside of our responsibilities to 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 engage in an argument with the applicant over it. Um, is, does that it just it puts us into the fray in a way that we feel like is not our role? I appreciate that, and that's what? why I want to try and find a way to make it less controversial with the or adversarial with the public, but at the same time providing a public an explanation as to you know this one was a key policy and this one was an aspirational policy and this is what went into some of that decision. So you know having having that presentation generally about how these things are decided on the website would be helpful. Um, sure. And then on an individual case by case basis. That, you know, just I'm trying to figure out how to also get that information. To um, the applicant, because because I feel the same thing. I want to maybe explain to the applicant why something a staff report was. A consistency statement was one way or the other, but I don't want to seem like an advocate. Um, for our case, right? So. So that's where you know I'll ask staff for something like that, but um, just basically trying to figure out how to get this information more to the public when they have these specific concerns. 
I think I think we can do that. The you know the the evolution of this so it's like is that um, the, the 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 notion of key policies. When we when we first drafted the plan, we did have this distinction, and it's in the it's in chapter one. It's been in chapter one since the plan was adopted. We're talking about these what we call prescriptive policies at the time versus aspirational policies. And aspirational policies were things that the city aspired to, but it would be unreasonable to hold every applicant to them. You know, um, for example, we we might have a, a policy to protect the floodplain, but this zoning case can't implement that policy because it's not in the floodplain. So you know. Um, then we had policies that we felt like every applicant should be kind of, if it's relevant to their case, should be held to. And we we used a, a, a language trick of, of, uh, of the aspirational policies were typically encourage this, promote that, and the um, the uh, prescriptive policies were like all should statements. New development should do X or Y. Um, and then when we were first. There were 550 policies in the plan when it was adopted. So people were like, how am I supposed to evaluate consistency staff? You know, we created a cheat sheet of all the should should statements and called it the, the key policy guide. And then later that um, got more formalized in the comp plan update. We put little orange dots on the policies. And then that with council voted on that, that kind of memorialized it in a more um, uh, definitive way. And we can continue to, I think, to highlight those in the staff reports through either adding a dot or maybe the, the, the we use a different, we use italics or bold and the type for those so you know which ones are, are uh, fall into that, into the, into the key policy bucket. Um, and I think, you know, uh, if there is a dispute, we can certainly elaborate in the meeting um, more on, on why staff made the determination they did. You know, we'll never be in a world where there's not, uh, room for reasonable people to disagree on this, though, because sometimes it is it is a close call, and you're trying to weight different things against each other, you know. And we're doing that all the time. How much do we weight uh, an increase in the housing supply against the change in in built character, you know? Um, and uh, different people will weight those those different goals differently. So that's just part of the part of the the nature of the beast. Vice Chair Winters. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for um, what you're going to be adding. That'll be very uh, helpful. Uh, but I also wanted to address Ira. Ira, you know, I have no problem with it. I absolutely love it because, you know, I have no problems addressing issues and comments in real time. So thank you. Commissioner O'Haver. Um, I'm wondering to get back to Blaney's comment and which I, I, I think sort of ties into one of my comments, I'm wondering if not more work for staff, but it seems like they feel rushed to get through their report because we've got nine cases on the agenda and they're trying to get through and they're trying to be respectful of everybody's time. And, and I appreciate that. But I wonder if they were to take a little bit more time to elaborate at the beginning. Again, I'm not creating more work, but just felt the that they had the ability to take a little bit longer and not rush through, then it might be beneficial for everyone, including the planning commission, for us to understand now knowing how the sausage is made more clearly for them to be able to elaborate. It might paint a better picture for us as well as the public. So just a thought. Thank you for that. Um, Commissioner Bennett. Thanks. This is a question. Um, will staff be providing responses to questions from the public in the participation portal? I mean, if it's a direct question, can you answer this? You know, not just I hate this project, but something that kind of requires a response. I'm asking because I was thinking about um, Commissioner Miller's um, comment and if someone has, if a member of the public has provided that line by line, we think it's inconsistent with this, we think it's inconsistent with this. If you're providing a response, then it will be memorialized there on the portal for everybody to see the response. Well, let me say this. If someone asks a direct question that is answerable 
by a reference to a factual piece of factual information or the code or the comp plan, then yes, absolutely. Um, I don't think we'll be using the portal to get into an argument with the public right. about how the different policies have been weighted in the consistency determination. Um, no, I meant the former. Yeah, okay. just the factual, yeah. this is what we, yeah, not, so, not, yeah, not I mean, arguing we, back and forth. You know, like the, the text change portal, which has obviously been up for longer, so we have more experience with it. We're, we're absolutely doing that. And, um, you know, we, we've got a separate form, one for questions, one for comments, and we answer all the questions. Now, sometimes those questions are, are, um, are, uh, are, in the nature of uh, commentary on the on, you can tell from the phrasing of the question that there's a, there's an opinion about the about the appropriateness of the text change behind it. We try to recognize that, but also stick to the um, try to keep our answer, answers as factual as possible. Thank you. Uh, were there, a, Commissioner O'Haver? Yeah, I have another question. Um, I'm kind of comparing the staff presentation to the staff report and and Ira, I do appreciate your comments because often I forget to think about what can be built versus what's being proposed to be built in the mm -hmm. comparison of that. And I know y'all include that slide sort of existing versus proposed zoning in your staff presentation which is always very helpful to me. But I'm just wondering, and I don't know that we can answer it now, but I wonder if in the staff report, and maybe it's in there and I, I don't, you know, see it, but I'm wondering if there are ways to do something similar, even with the policies or, or some way, again, to sort of get that in the staff report to make sure it's clear and we're, uh, we're um, comparing the existing zoning to the proposed. I, I don't know. I, I just, again, I think that would be helpful both for planning commission, but most importantly for the public as again, I know we've talked about this a lot and, you know, Nicole and I bat this around all the time, especially for someone who doesn't engage in this all the time, you get a notice in the mail You've never gone through this process before. You pull up the comprehensive plan, you find it online at 650 pages. You've got a 54 page staff report. You're trying to figure out, and, and all you're thinking is like, oh my gosh, versus maybe somewhere in the staff report, there's just a way again to explain just a little bit more about we are comparing existing versus proposed. Again, not trying to create more work, but just maybe rethinking the way the staff report is put together. So just some thoughts. Thank you for that, um, Commissioner O'Haver. It's it's funny, it is in there. It's just, it doesn't show up as like a summary table the way it does in the PowerPoint presentations. And so I agree, it might be helpful to put that summary piece um, in the staff report at, in some place. Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Maybe we maybe we do that. Um, I will also note. Um, I looked through the agenda for text change um, last night, and I noticed the presentation format was different, and I liked it. <laughs> so, I find it helpful. I mean to specifically with text changes, um, also with comp plan amendments, and then maybe with area plans when they go through, I mean, with, with text changes, explaining the intent and the goal of the text change, and then explaining how these particular words meet that goal versus presenting a bunch of words. <laughs> because our first question is always, what, like, why are we doing that, right? So. I think I thought that was really helpful. I I, I did want to make note that that presentation um, read a little bit differently and it was a lot more clear and I thought it was really helpful. So thank you, whoever put that together. Um, okay, if you guys are okay, I'm gonna shift to the next agenda item, which is um, commission coordination. So um, as you know, we are one of many um, appointed boards and commissions. I think there are over 30 um, at the city of Raleigh, 
Um, you know some of the more commonly referred to ones in the rezoning process, which would be um, Stormwater Management Advisory Committee, um, the SMAC, um, or even um, the RHDC, Raleigh Historic Development Commission. Um, and then also um, the Board of Adjustment, which is not part of our work, but but you likely know that name. But there, but trust that there are um, over twenty other ones that live um, that live out there. Um, we um, we now have a liaison to the SMAC. Um, um, I was voluntold that I would play that role, <laughs> and so. <laughs> um, but I think that is really helpful, and I think um, if it does. If we do have some larger policy question related to stormwater management, and that may come up in our new um, mobility and infrastructure proposed committee, or that may come up just on a, any particular case, or if there's a case that's particularly gnarly, I think um, it would be appropriate to coordinate um, with the SMAC at that time. I know um, Commissioner Bennett, um, you had put in the question about how we work with boards and commissions um, in addition to the to the SMAC. I don't know if you had any question or comment you wanted to provide at this point. You put me on the spot. Oh, apologies. <laughs> I'm trying Sorry. to remember what I was thinking. Um, it might have been related to um, Bike Ped Advisory Commission, the BPAC. No, I don't think it's that one. No. Okay. I think. I don't know. I think I might have been thinking more about the historic. RHDC, but keep going and it'll come back to me. But no, no <laughs> I worries. can't remember. So all of those, um, all of those meetings are, of course, open to the public. Um, and during these times, they're all, they're all meeting virtually. Um, so you can find information on how to virtually attend those meetings on the city's website. Um, specifically, if you look at the at the calendar section on the website, I think that's on the landing page. Um, or if you go into um, into board docs, um, you can you can snoop around that way to see who's having what meeting when and um, what what is showing up on their agenda. Um, but if there is um, particular information that any other board and commission is discussing that you would like to hear, by all means attend. Um, and then um, at the end of our agendas, our regular planning commission agenda, um, during report of commission members, you can um, make comment or note what you heard at that other board or commission if, if you feel like there's some further action or recommendation that, that us as a body might take. Did I filibuster for you long enough? <laughs> I can if it's helpful, up. I found yeah. the original email. Okay. Commissioner Bennett. So uh, there was a mention um, about maybe something on the horizon with the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission. Um, but then you specifically asked, what about Raleigh Historic Development Commission? What about Board of Adjustment? Uh, in the, the vein of, should we have a more formal or informal connection point with those boards? Thank you. I was searching for the email too. I just didn't want to have any questions for the retreat. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Um, so another item um, that I think I submitted to you, Travis, uh, was related to annual work plan or um, year in review summary. I know um, Planning Commission has historically submitted kind of a report at the end of the year, like we've done X amount of cases and um, there, there are some amount of metrics in there. Um, I just wanted to know if you could speak to that a little bit, the timeline of that, how, get, how that gets put together and what type of information goes in that. Sure, I'd be happy to. So there was a time when the Planning Commission generated um, a report back to the City Council. But as you know, the Planning Commission um, is largely in a position of responding to things, right? So um, you see applications, you see requests to change the code or the comprehensive plan or the zoning map, uh, and then make a recommendation on those things. Uh, so the, again, there was a time where that information was consolidated and then just delivered to the city council. Um, that, that practice, uh, we pulled back from that practice a number of years ago, 
uh, because we started to create um, a more holistic set of information uh, related to the data book uh, that we would submit to um, the, the city council. And uh, that really was done in the spirit of identifying um, not only workload uh, for the planning commission, but also identifying any uh, trends that we saw. Uh, and so we would deliver that to the city council and identify um, any uh, comprehensive plan amendments that we felt uh, might be necessary or needed as a result. Um, and that's that's a document that, that you all see as well. So a, a traditional planning commission report has not happened in, in quite some time. Um, and you might think, well, that's strange because I see other boards and commissions presenting their annual report to the city council, uh, usually uh, in the June or August timeframe, which is true. Uh, however, I would admit that those boards operate a little bit differently than the planning commission. Uh, they are um, what I might call a more free range environment uh, where topics could be explored um, and then actual work plan items could be identified and then worked on throughout the course of the year. I think the reason for uh, you know not producing that type of report for the planning commission uh, simply is, is one of saturation. I mean, you, you know, and you've heard all morning, you've got a really heavy workload and your meetings are always full of um, of these applications and requests that you must respond to. So carving out additional time uh, to to discuss um, you know things that um, you might want to change from a policy perspective or a regulatory perspective, um, you, you really don't have uh, the luxury of that time. However, I would note that the subcommittees do give you an environment to to do so. Um, so. Uh, all that said, uh, there is an ability for you to produce an annual report should you so choose. Um, we would just need as a staff to understand what type of information you'd like to communicate. You know, if it is uh, simply reporting metrics back, I might submit that we've got a different uh, tool to do that. Uh, however, if it is um, more the intention of identifying uh, trends that you might like to explore, uh, be it code changes or policy changes, the annual report is the appropriate way to do that. So just boiling it down to you know a, a five second pitch, the, that's the reason an annual report exists is you identify things you want to talk about. City Council says, yes, you may go talk about those things and you do it over the course of the year and report back. I don't know if anybody had any comment or thoughts on that. Commissioner O'Haver. Travis, um, does staff track trends? I think because again, I, I'm amazed most of y'all can remember back cases and can give the code numbers and what was going on. And especially when Roberta calls me, I'm like, hold on, let me pull that one back up and remember what it is. You know, I'm trying to find it and Roberta's, you know, telling me everything that I'd said, you know, a month ago. So it's really hard for me to, to try to wrap my head around trends, but I think that would be something very valuable to track and maybe as part of the reporting at the end, uh, if well, if you see trends or something at some point at the end of the meeting to be able to identify those and, and have us discuss them. And the other thing I would say about the annual report, I, I do think it's probably a good idea, maybe something to talk about. The only thing that I would, and I've got some stuff for the lightning round if we get there, that's sort of along these lines. I would just caution that, you know, council's busy too, and, and I don't want to put a lot of time into something that is not going to have value and, and, you know, mean something. And so, again, from my experience on other boards and commissions, sometimes those reports are just sort of a report. So if we decide to do that, I hope we can make them robust and meaningful and that there'll, there'll be some weight to it that people will consider it. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, maybe as a first step, Travis, the, um, the, the data book that you mentioned, um, maybe presenting that to us might be a good first step prior to jumping into putting together um, an annual report. Because I'm, I'm assuming that that information is, is probably presented to council during their annual retreat. Is that true? Um, not during their retreat, it happens on a council meeting agenda. So y'all have seen the report that we put together as a staff um, that usually mm -hmm. comes with a package of comprehensive plan amendments. So I believe that was presented to you. Oh, gosh, probably within the last 2 months, somewhere around there. 
Um, and again, it's just an identification of workload trends that we see, um, and then a package of comprehensive plan amendments that would modify policies or land use map uh, contained within the comprehensive plan. Um, so if you want, I could link you all back to that presentation. We should be able to find that. Maybe revisiting that might be helpful at this point as a, as a first step. Um, Brian, since you kicked it off, do you want to, do you want to go into your lightning round? Oh, are we there now? Go, you can go for it. And then, um, I'll, I'll kick over to vice chair winners on her, um, infill construction. item. Well, um, actually, before we get there, I did pull up the boards and commissions. Which one deals with traffic? I don't even see one that deals with traffic and infrastructure. Is that the Raleigh? I mean, you've got Raleigh Transit Authority. Is that? I was referring to our, our one of our subcommittees. No, I know, but I'm just curious. Does the city have a commission or a board, I guess, that is looking at transportation, infrastructure, roadway? You know, I mean, we talk about this in every meeting, and I'm just wondering if the city has a board or commission that deals with those issues. We do not. The, well, the city council has a subcommittee called transportation uh, committee that right. have issues. Yeah, city council does. But anyway, it's just something to think about. I'm looking at 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 20, 29 mm -hmm. different boards and commissions. And we're talking about transportation and traffic in every meeting. So it, it might make sense. I don't know. Um, so lightning round, I want to be careful that I don't upset the folks who put us on this commission. Um, but I, I, I think we've all sort of felt some frustration about the amount of time that we've put into some of these cases and sort of where it goes from there. And, you know, I've had conversations with some of y'all about policies or really not policies, but lack thereof. And, you know, what our role is in that and how do we impact that and, you know, get bang for our buck, so to speak. I mean, we're not, uh, Travis kind of mentioned, you know, you don't, you don't get into the planning staff for, you know, accolades. I mean, we didn't get on the planning commission because we like to sit in four hour meetings four times a month. I mean, you know, we're all very committed to our community and it's important to us. And I, I, I don't want to say I feel like, cause it's not feeling, I believe that we should consider a way to present ourselves if that's what we're lacking um, a little bit more robustly to our bosses, whether it be through lack of policies or our decisions or our deliberations or our conversations, um, because we put our heart and soul into this and, and nobody wants to put that much time and then say, okay, what are we doing here? And so I'll just come out and say it again and, and maybe I'll get kicked off this commission, but I, we don't do this for the fun of it. We do it because we're passionate and we care about our community. And, and sometimes I feel like, damn, I said feel again. I believe that there are times when, um, I believe there are times I don't see that. So that's my single lightning round item. A uh, way to start off with something really light and easy to talk about. Um, not, I, I say that in jest. Um, I will say this because at, at times I do share in that frustration. Um, I think one thing that helps me is when you think about policy, right? Policy and policy at a city scale is a huge cruise ship you're on, right? And and to paraphrase like paraphrase speakers who are better than myself it's like you're on this cruise ship you all you can do is shift it one degree or maybe three degrees and that feels like you're not making any change at all but your port mm -hmm. of call with a three degree shift is that's massively different so the impact you have now may be small the impact of 
changing how staff reports are thought about or um, changing how neighborhood meetings are um, conducted. That's that has a massive impact. But being able to see that impact, you have to you have to kind of play the long game. So I just I just offer that as a as an alternate perspective. I don't I appreciate the time and effort that goes into this, and um, I appreciate everyone agrees to let me yammer on for four hours. Um, <laughs> but it, your 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 skill and your thoughtfulness do not go unnoticed. So. As just an alternate perspective, Brian. Um, Commissioner Lantman, I saw your hand. Yeah, just along some of those lines, um, you know, the stats that were presented earlier about the number of cases we have and how quickly we actually do vote them out. Um, that was really encouraging and I, I hope council knows, I think, because they too get, you know, they hear the ones that go on forever. And I think that that becomes some of the, you know, the pressure we get or the, you know, some of the heat we get for not reacting fast enough. But, you know, those those four cases are so distracting. Um, but as a whole, I'm, I'm really proud of what we do. And the same comment before, when we get a case, you know, what we vote out is much better than what we originally got it. So thank you for putting that together. And I hope that that's kind of noted across the board. Vice Chair Winters, um, do you want to talk at all about infill construction? Yes, thank you. Um, it's a question or a concern that has come up uh, in previous um, cases. And I would just like to see how we can better address it in terms of applicants when we're looking at infill. I'll say specifically in two ways. One, in terms of recycling and not just an um, undeveloped land, but maybe recycling um, abandoned structures that can be utilized. Um, a great topic that came up was, uh, let's just say, Rembert, the, the red barn with maybe the gold corral that was up the street with, you know, a structure and amenities that were already conducive. How we can look at structures um, like that and, and how, the, how we can begin to promote um, such structure, if we're looking in terms of also an environmental impacts or, or reducing environmental impacts, um, things like that. That's one topic. And the other way I'm looking at it is a topic that, that has, has popped up recently is when we're talking about, and I can't remember the current term, but I think with infill prior, we were talking about the scattered site policy mm -hmm. um, and how in, in terms of density, uh, and the type of density that's happening, but with, with that caveat of being um, their transit and looking at uh, at what point having some kind of bar of what point that even though it, it meets the mark of being near transit, uh, that that is still too much within is too concentrated within an area. So those are the two aspects. I, if you will, can answer. Or, or help us, or we can help flush out and get yeah. some ideas behind. Um, I'll follow up on one of your items, Shelly, the recycling building thing. So, um, promoting adaptive reuse, part of that is kind of outside of what we do, but the piece that's inside what we do is looking at um, barriers to adaptive reuse that might be currently embedded in the code. And so um, proposing changes to the regulation to help promote and incentivize and remove barriers for adaptive reuse. I think that that might be that might get to part of part of that piece of what of what you mentioned. Um, the other part, the scattered site policy, I'll have to, I'll have to leave, um, I'll have to leave that to staff to respond to. So, was the question about uh, when you said too much in one location, affordable housing specifically, or was it about uh, density in your transit? Well, to the point of, I think it's more so the affordable housing because that. Okay. I'll just leave it right there to answer your question because I'll prattle on. Right, so, you know, um, we, we, we have a policy um, 
about that that gives weight to d distributing um, uh, affordable housing broadly throughout the community, and that is typically uh, implemented because it's part of the selection criteria for how we fund through our gap financing program um, uh, low income housing tax credit projects. That's that's primarily how that gets dealt with, um, and we have typically though created an exception for projects located on transit. And you know, this is one of those areas where we hear a lot of competing goals, because on the one hand, you're saying, well, we don't want to concentrate all of our affordable housing in a few transit locations. On the other hand, we're also hearing very loudly from members of the public and others that uh, uh, affordable housing is what's necessary, is where the riders are going to live, because it's a lower income population that predominantly uses the transit system, and therefore we need to be putting as much affordable housing on the transit system as possible. And, you know, I, we, we either have to adopt some specific metrics as to, as to how much is too much, or we're in the realm of sort of opinion, right? And the other thing I think is, is quite true is for a long time, um, it was our policy to try to build more affordable housing outside of uh, the, you know, the lowest income neighborhoods in Raleigh. Uh, because that was part of the ethic of the scattered site. We want to give um, people who need affordable housing an opportunity to live in some of the higher income parts of the city. Maybe that's going to be closer to jobs and services. Now, with some of the lowest income neighborhoods experiencing rapid gentrification, we've kind of reversed that position and we're trying to put more affordable housing back in those neighborhoods because the naturally occurring affordable housing that used to populate the neighborhoods is under threat and is rapidly being lost. So this is just always a moving target and it's hard to have, um, it, it's hard to like settle this uh, abstractly without looking, there's always gonna be some case by case um, uh, nature to each decision that's in front of us. To, it, it, I think it's just inevitable because the landscape in which we're trying to intervene in the housing market is changing so rapidly. And we have so many different competing objectives. Um, for uh, how we wish to locate affordable housing. I, that's probably not a complete answer to your question, but you know, we are, we are trying to, trying to, to the best of our abilities, follow our policy and set policy that seems to be um, waiting what, have, what has been the big, big picture, which is that we want affordable housing residents, lower income residents to have good access to quality transit so they can spend less mm -hmm. on vehicles and have more access to jobs and services. Did I see a hand come up during that? Vice Chair Winters, that it, did that start to address your your topic? Yeah, it it did, and I do appreciate the the metrics because I think that was the the base of what I was asking. Uh, so it's not necessarily subjective um, that we can look at something that is. My my point is that we can try to remove as much subjectivity as possible, um, and just look at something in terms of percentages. This is what it is. And then move forward. Right. Um, so thank you. And I do understand that this is uh, a moving target, for lack of a better word, because there is a lot of transition going on within the city. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just it's, it's just interesting when that term comes up. Um, it, it's just interesting because we don't hear it a lot, but when we do, that seems to be the caveat, or I'll say loophole, to right. the to the um, to the to the question or. Or to the situation, um, yeah. That that was it. Thank you. Um, any other items? Just random things you want to throw at me, <laughs> Commissioner Bennett? You know, I'm always happy to throw things <laughs> at you. <laughs> um, so um, since we're getting close to the end, I we feel like we're wrapping up. So I just want to say a couple things. First, um, I do enjoy this. I enjoy working with you all. Um, I am, I guess, a little weird in the sense that I, I do enjoy the time that I spend on this. And I will say, um, I guess it means I don't have much of a life, but I spend a minimum of like 20 hours a week on this. So, but I enjoy it. Uh, you know, I'm not kicking and screaming doing it. I really enjoy it. And um, I, I have been responding to, you know, applicant requests to me 
community requests to meet. So I feel like a lot of my time I, I, I I'm doing the planning commission stuff. Sometimes I forget what my actual full time job is, but but I enjoy it and I appreciate it. And I've learned a lot because most of my 26 years now have been in the private sector. So in the private sector, I don't get to delve into land use comp plans and codes like we have here. So it's been really good for me to, it's been a learning experience and it's been good for me to see the other side of a lot of what I have, um, what I've been doing. And I do appreciate, you know, what I've learned and just being able to work with you all and learn from you all. Um, the other thing I was going to say is it would be great if somehow um, Roberta could, let me phrase this right. Ken does an excellent job at the council meetings presenting the planning commission report. And I understand where he has to come from and just be very factual, very dispassionate is our word, and just present here are the facts. Ken often gets questions like, well, why was there a split vote on this? Or, you know, sometimes it's binomial, or whoever's presenting. Why did the commission think that this policy wasn't really consistent? And I believe the chair is in a better position to answer some of those, what was the PC thinking when they said this type question? There was one in particular this past Tuesday night that drove me nuts. And many of you know, because I started texting you, that's not what we said. But th there was a question about why we thought a certain policy wasn't relevant. And the answer was, because the commission was sympathetic to the residents. And I was like, no, that wasn't it. No, no, no. I mean, while we do try to be sympathetic, we really thought it didn't apply. And I believe it was the one about infill. And we didn't believe it applied because it was putting apartments where houses are now. And I believe our comment was the infill policy applied more to vacant land. Well, not more, but applied to vacant land and not to where there were existing homes. That was not communicated to council. So it came off like, oh, the planning commission was just being sympathetic to the residents, so they wanted to strike that policy. That's just one example. I have many because I've started watching all of the council meetings and I'm up until midnight with them, taking notes and texting people. And so if there is a way, I know Roberta attends some of them, and I know she can't just jump in and start talking if they don't ask her to, but if there's, you know, I watch some meetings and the person from the board is actually answering the questions about what the board decided and why they decided it. So if Ken or Bynum or whoever is making the presentation, but Roberta can answer the questions, especially if they're PC specific, I think that would give council a better understanding of why we did what we did if they haven't watched the meeting I mean, or read the minutes? I think part of that, Nicole, is a function of um, when I go to the council meetings on every other Tuesday at one, um, I'm there in person staying six feet apart from Ken, who's there in person, and we are looking at a screen of projected images of the council members. They're not in the room with us. And so it functioned differently in days of yore, like Ken would show up and planning commission chair would be standing there right next to them and they would kind of co-present. Part of it, I think, is a function of our quasi virtual environment, but um, I appreciate the sentiment. I, um, I had some thoughts about some recent choices. Well, I because share. I just think sometimes it's not, it doesn't reflect what we actually said. And and so sometimes I think to Brian's point where we feel like, well, that whole concern was just dismissed. You know, it's because it wasn't presented or it, they didn't read the minutes or maybe it wasn't really detailed in the minutes. And so I just feel like that could be a way to help them truly appreciate a certain sentiment that we had beyond, oh, they were just being sympathetic to the applicant or to the property owner, because that's 
generally not the case. We, we spend a lot of time coming up with thoughtful reasons, I think, for why we agree or disagree with the certain um, consistency statement. I agree. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Winters. Thank you. And, you know, I'll just add, or maybe sometimes a new reasoning is made up that isn't true. I'll just say like um, split votes when it was unanimous. And so the other thing that I would possibly add is if it's a, a matter of um, you being six feet away and, and the visual not being there, is it then possible that you can then be in the screenshot if it's somewhat maybe behind um, Ken? So the visual of you being there or something to indicate, some, if, if, it's the, it's the, if it's the lack of visual, being in the visual um, and be like nodding or, or shaking your head that could possibly promote some kind of conversation to try to engage you in it, that might be helpful in this environment in which we are. That's a good point. And Travis, I think you kind of mentioned a little bit, maybe Ken did, um, projecting when we might be in a different environment. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a great question. I don't know that I have a specific answer for you. Um, we're going to come back to an person meeting at some point, both Planning Commission and City Council. Um, so I, I don't know when that will be. We're following the lead of the city manager's office and the city council. Um, I, I would imagine that when they announce back, uh, we as a planning commission will do the same thing. Uh, so that will be a conversation that we start to have uh, sometime this spring about what it looks like to come back in person. I'll, I'll work with the chairperson on that and we'll uh, obviously communicate um, any change, uh, to the full commission in advance of that. But uh, again, we're following the lead of the, the council I would anticipate that at some point, you know, mid year later this year, they will be back in person. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Bowers. So, um, I think what I will do going forward is at least. It, the setup in the room is hard to do what you're asking because of where the podium sits vis a vis the seats. You'd, you'd have to be actually standing on a seat. Behind me in order to be in the picture frame. It's just which, I, which it's, I'm not opposed to doing. <laughs> so, um. What I can do is, is make sure that the council is aware that she is in the room and is there to answer any questions or elaborate further. And I think the other thing is simply that um, uh, I will do a better job of making sure that I am fully prepared to, to uh, speak um, more accurately to the reasons for any dissenting votes or other actions that the PC took. So I'll I'll own that. And if I misrepresented any of the reasons, I'm, I'm happy to uh, do a better job going forward. Um, Commissioner O'Haver, I saw your hand, and then Commissioner Bennett. I'm, I'm going to let Commissioner Bennett, Commissioner Lanton go first and come okay. back to me. Uh, thank you. Um, can I just, just to be clear, I, I, I didn't mean to imply that you are misrepresenting the commission or you're being inaccurate at all, but I think you're doing great. I just think sometimes when it's a what were they thinking type question, you really may not be able to answer that. But I think Roberta, having been in the conversation, can answer it. Uh, I don't even want to say better. She can just answer it, period. I, I think sometimes you just are the wrong person to right. say what the commission was thinking because you weren't part of the commission around the table making the having the discussion. And I am more than happy to defer those answers to Roberta when she's there, which is most of the time, you know. <laughs> I was just going to suggest the same thing. If the if the question is what was the planning commission thinking, just say here's Roberta, <laughs> or or Shelley if you're there that day, you know, in substitution, whatever that is, can you guys step in and make that comment? If it's what was the planning commission thinking? To to be clear, I don't attend in person the public hearings that um, that had not been general practice. Um, but on the, the Tuesday, the, the Tuesday at 1 meeting, um, I'm generally there and have received questions maybe 1 time. Um, or, or witnessed a very specific question, maybe once or twice. Um, anyway, are there, are, are there any other comments? Commissioner O'Haver. I have a very important question. 
when we get back in person, are we gonna need to be like showered and dressed up and <laughs> shaved? No. Or are we just gonna keep rolling like we've been rolling for a year? I will make one note that those those meetings are also televised, right? But they're only filmed from the table up. So <laughs> if, if you have a mullet outfit on, no one will notice. Um, however, bringing your toddler and or dog might be frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> um, does anyone else? I have anything else you want to share or anything? Um, otherwise, I think Travis, can you summarize kind of next steps for us? Um, I will do my best. So there were a couple of very specific takeaways um, from this meeting. First of all, I want to thank everyone for sticking with us. Um, I know it's another long meeting that that you've been subject to, so I appreciate that. Um, I would note that we've got someone here who's taking minutes uh, because this is an official, you know, meeting of the commission. So um, we will have those not in your next agenda on the 11th, but they'll be in a subsequent agenda, so you can review those. And we'll make sure to highlight the the takeaways um, or uh, action items from staff. So I've heard some requests for um, some existing information that we have, making that available to the commission, be it my presentation today, um, the presentation related to um, our action items with the, the comprehensive plan uh, from um, our annual report. Um, and then information about uh, transportation that came up. So we'll share all of that, what I'll call prefabricated information with y'all um, when we are done with this meeting. Um, I don't know that I saw a request for anything else other than um, just thinking about the transportation committee name. And again, that's something that will come back to you. Um, so assuming that everyone go in that direction, and I'm looking specifically at the chairperson of that committee, uh, for a thumbs up, thumbs down, thank you. Um, we will start putting that in motion and then we'll bring to you um, at a subsequent meeting changes to your bylaws that reflect that uh, that name change and then we'll process that for uh, the city council. So I think that's all I had for specific follow ups. Now, there were some requests for uh, additional information, maybe enhancing presentation, staff reports, uh, things of that nature, the way that we operate. And that's information I'll put the staff and then we'll have an internal discussion um, and we can do one of two things either come back to the commission and give you an update on what we've done uh, that could happen through a, um, the deputy director's member in your agenda uh, or we can give you a formal presentation if you wish um, or door number three is we can just start doing it because i think we heard pretty clearly what, what you're asking for um, assuming that we meet your intent, we can um, make the changes. And if we don't hit the mark, uh, I'm certain that someone will tell us uh, that we need to course correct. So um, we're happy to carry that information forward. Commissioner Reeves. Um, Travis, um, also, could you clarify what may be posted on the website for public use? Uh, what data would be presented? Uh, specifically from our conversation today, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, that's, that's something that I'll carry back to staff. Um, we've again, taken very detailed notes and, um, if it's something that's pre-prepared, like presentation that we had today or presentations that we have in the can, uh, that's something that we can put up on the board docs, uh, portal. So it's available to people. That's a pretty common, uh, technique that we use. Um, if it's something that is of general interest, like. Um, I heard a question about um, having general planning information maybe shared with the public or posted on our website or something like that. Um, that's information and um, a request that I'll take back to staff and ask them about the appropriate implementation of that for sure. Thank you. All right. If there are no other comments or questions, um, I say we can call it close. And I, I really did want to thank everybody for spending their time this morning, um, especially people who are not showing up on camera because I know you're lurking in the background working very hard. Um, we appreciate everything you guys are doing. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.